This is a recording for the GAA Oral History Project. My name is Regina Fitzpatrick. Today's date is the 1st of September 2010. This interview is taking place in Abbeyside, County Waterford. Can you say your name, please? My name is Seamus O'Brien. And what year were you born, Seamus? I was born in 1921, on the 28th of July 1921. So, Seamus, can you tell me, um, are you, where are you from originally? I, I'm, also, I'm from Abbeyside. I was born in Abbeyside. I was born in, in uh, Shear Street in Abbeyside in 1921. And what's, what sort of a place was Abbeyside when you were growing up? It was a very, very small village. It was only about one-fifth of what it is at the moment. The population was very small, very close, and uh, very traditional in many ways. Like, you know, you sort of uh, celebrate all the old customs, like Pattern Day, you know, the Feast of St. Augustine, who was the patron saint of the place. We used to do all those sorts of things, and it was a very small, very, very small uh, seaside uh, village. As a matter of fact, about 50 years before I was born, it was only a hamlet, a fishing hamlet, like your own people. All, most of the people living there depended on the sea for their living, either by fishing or by sailing. Your own had a lot of, uh, a lot of families who were, had uh, people lost at sea. As a matter of fact, both my grandfathers uh, were drowned at sea, and I had an uncle drowned at sea. That's the kind of an environment that I came up in. And you said your father was a sailor himself. My father was a sailor. And uh, my grandfather, both my grandfathers were sailors. They were both sea captains, in fact. They were both lost at sea. And my father, my father died at home. He died in retirement at the age of, he was 86 when he died. And my mother, who was a seamstress, like that was a, a dressmaker in modern day terms, and uh, she, she lived to be 96, and she died at uh, 20 years ago. And when you say sailoring, what kind of work did that involve that your father did? What kind of... What, how, you, you said your father was a, a sailor, and do you know much about what type of work he did or what his day-to-day -day might have been like? Or? He, was, uh, he was a deep-sea sailor originally, which means that he, went to, he sailed ships from, from Cardiff to... He went, he, there's stories about him going to America, parts of America. He went to New Zealand, and he was on a famous 11-month voyage to Australia. 11 months, he was 11 months out of port, 11 months out of Swansea in Wales. And he said uh, he'd come home then and sit home for maybe a month or so and go away sailing again. And in the end of his years, for the last 15 years of his sailing life, uh, he sailed on a, a weekly boat. She was sailed out of Dungarten. The name of the boat was the Lady Bell. And uh, that was during just trips to Cardiff and it was uh, sort of trading from port to port, you know. And he retired then at the age of about 70, I think. And uh, that was, he, he was, uh, we were very much involved in seafaring, my family, were because uh, all my uncles, I think, went to sea, and then an uncle lost at sea. And, uh, and that was the same, more, more or less the same for all the uh, families in, in Abbeyside, in Abbeyside, which was almost on top of the sea. Were that, there any sorry my growing up days? And were there any traditions with sailoring or superstitions or things like that that you can remember? Um, no, I I, rem I remember some of the tragedies. You know, people being drowned at sea. And as a matter of fact, I remember people being drowned locally, because as I said, we lived on the sea, and I remember a few people now who were drowned locally, swimming or fishing. And uh, I, I haven't a very clear recollection now of any uh, particular tragedy. But I do know there were tragedies. I know there was an awful lot of grief and sorrowing and all that around uh, Abbeyside mm -hmm. in my growing up years, you know. And I know some of my friends also had 
uh, people who lost uh, family members at sea. And generally that's the way it was going up there in, in the 1920s. And I'm sure even a long time before that it was even uh, more tragic, I suppose, in, in ways, you know. And would there have been any customs around, I mean, I suppose, blessing of the boats or anything like that that you used to do around yeah. the sea? There was the blessing of the boats. That was one thing. That was an annual thing. There was also boat racing. Uh, that means four old boats. Four people in a boat, in a, just an ordinary rowing boat. And ourselves and Dungarvan. Dungarvan is the town. That Dungarvan is our town, you know. And, uh, and it's a lovely town, absolutely one of the nicest towns in Ireland, we believe, because of its location and everything else, but, uh, and its nearness to all the other things like the Mount Mallory and Helvig, the Gaeltacht, and uh, many places of great interest and all that sort of thing. But uh, we used to have an annual boat race, and it was always held on Passion Day. You know, Passion Day would be uh, the Feast of the Saints, patron saint of the parish and the patron saint of our parish was St Augustine and that's celebrated on the 28th of August each year and uh, we, we'd have uh, boat racing, we'd have the slippery pole, that was a pole that was uh, greased and stretching out into the sea and uh, at high tide and at the end of it there'd be a pig's head and that was the prize. You had to walk out the pole uh, to the end of, of the pole, and to got the, you, you got the, you got the pig's head in, which in the days of the nineteen twenties and nineteen ten, and all, all, all at that era, you know, was something. And you'd all, you'd also get an award then of something, but the pig's head was the thing you had to take off the end of the pole. That was the greasy pole, and there was all sorts again. There was sheaf throwing, you know. Uh, that's the sheaf. You know what a sheaf is, do you? It's a bundle of. Uh, Oats or or, or, or uh, wheat or something after the after the after the uh, that would take place after the trashing, and you throw it over a, a pole, just like a goalpost now with with a string attached to the side, and whoever would throw the highest would be given the award. We 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 was the step dancing competitions and all these things. You know, it was full of. Funny, we had uh, three-legged races, all those sort of, some of them were sport at that time, and there were contests and competitions that wouldn't be sort of recognised now, you know, they'd be kind of, look to be childish now, but there were great fun and great sport and those things. We had the long kick in football then and the long puck in hurling, all on the same day. You know, there was all that sort of, uh, of uh, amusement for people, and... Uh, were your parents originally from Abbeyside, or...? They were. Both my parents were from Abbeyside. We were uh, going back for several, several generations. I don't know where we originated from at all. I know that my mother's family originated from the Gaeltacht area, which is Ring. That's only about three miles across the bay, between Dungarvan and, 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 uh, and Helvig Head. And my father, they're going back for generations and generations. We don't know where they originally came from, but we can go back for many, many, uh, many, many generations, you know, to, to uh, identify him with, with Abbeyside. And tell me about, do you know how far back Gaelic games go in Abbeyside? How far back does? The Gaelic games go, so the hurling and the football, would they be? Yeah, well, we have photographs of teams in Abbeyside uh, in 1918, 1917 and 1918. That's how far they go in Abbeyside. But we do have uh, a record of a team being, uh, being uh, or having taken part in a championship in uh, 1857, 1887. At that time, the the, uh, the association started in Warford. The GA started in Warford. The GA originated in Warford in Kilmac Thomas. And the 
the, the, the uh, first county convention started in December uh, 1887. 1887. And I would say did have a team in the following year, that would be 1888. But then there was a fall away and there was... There were no clubs really actually, you know, uh, properly organised at that time. You know, basically like we had, Warford had, we had 14 senior football teams shortly after the establishment of the GA in, in, uh, in Tullis in November uh, 1884. And it was all football then in all the counties. You see, hurling was much slower to take on and the reason was, or one of the reasons was that the expense involved for football, you only had to have a football. You know, that was all you had to have. And you didn't have hurlies or hurling balls and all that sort of thing. And most of the counties, uh, we, like most of the counties, played uh, football. And we had a very, very successful start in 1887. We had 14 teams taking part in football in the county. And so from there really we set off. In, in uh, That's the county now. But my club, uh, Abbey Side, we were uh, 18, 18, uh, 1917, and from those years on, we did have a club. But we really didn't have a properly established club in Abbey Side until about 1927. And we didn't have a ground in Abbey Side uh, of our own uh, until 1960. 1959 rather. That was the first time we had a ground of our own. And that was a situation like all over the county. Very few clubs in our county. Very few of the 52 clubs. We have 52 clubs in the county. Uh, registered clubs at the moment. And every one of them now have their own ground of course. And their own uh, dressing rooms. Their own pavilions. and Their own holding walls. And their own everything. Many of them have bars like their own. They've uh, really advanced in that regard. But at that time, when we started our club, uh, we had nothing. In fact, all the clubs, not only here in Abbeyside, not only in, here in Warford rather, but throughout all Munster and throughout all the association depended on the generosity of farmers to allow them to play matches, you know, underground. There was no such thing as uh, admission prices to matches at the early stage of the association. Uh, I, I sort of researched this uh, many, many years ago and it was a number of years after the commencement of the association that a uh, gate collection began and that was only for the very important matches then because they didn't have the organisation or the backup, they didn't have grounds that were enclosed and there was a whole series of reasons why you couldn't do that, you know. In fact, it is an interesting thing that I discovered in my research that it was a long time, quite a number of years, before uh, a gate of £100 was taken by the association. You know, now you read in the, in, in the Australian uh, House report this year, the over 20 million, 24 million or something uh, taken last year. Now, that's a massive uh, increase and it shows... It illustrates the extent to which the, the association has uh, developed. But I'm, I'm jumping the gun a bit there now, uh, Eugenie. You know, you asked me about my club yeah. starting. It started in that time, 1917-1918. That was the first time that we played hurling and football uh, as a club. Would your parents or any of your parents' family have been involved in the games, do you know, down through the years? No, my... my uh, my, my, a number of my families played, they all played underage, all of them, and uh, a number of them played adult, and uh, one, I've only one son actually involved now. I have grandsons involved and granddaughters involved. I have a grandson, I have two grandsons in Cork, they were born in Cork, and uh, they're quite good. They're good. I, I, I feel that they will be they'll make it uh, up the line, you know, and uh, 
One of them is Alan O'Brien and the other is Con is uh, Conor O'Brien. And in, in Kildare I have a daughter. Uh she's only she's not sixteen yet and she's quite a good camogie player and ladies football player. And her name is Aoife O'Brien. And they're kind of continuing the tradition in my family, you know, that that's uh I hope they I hope they'll continue it and I know they will continue it. Tell me, what's your own earliest memory of Gaelic games? Your first memory of hurling or football? Well, my first memory, I suppose, of hurling and football was cycling to Tullus. Tullus is about 53 miles from here. Cycling with a group of other people from Abbeyside. Uh, cycling up to matches. My wife would play a, a game in there. We'd play Limerick or we'd play Clare or play some team, usually it was either Clare or Limerick or Cork, because you really, very rarely paid to play in their home ground then. But uh, my, that's one of my longest memories now. And I cycled to Cork and back uh, to a game. I cycled, cycled the Tullers twice. But my own personal, I suppose, uh, recollection was in 1938, with a friend of mine, a very good friend of mine, he's dead since we went, we travelled to Dublin to uh, the 1938 All Ireland and um, when Warford played Dublin, we travelled on a half ticket. We each had a half ticket and we were just gone 16. And uh, we, we got through all right going up, but the, coming back from Dublin, the, the ticket collector wouldn't accept it that we were underage. And it was very, very, very. Uh, I won't say ugly now, but he, he was very, he was a problem for us. And uh, we wore short trousers going up to establish that we were young fellas. And we had uh, long trousers with us that we changed when we got to Kingsbridge Station. And uh, we were overconfident coming back then. We wore the long trousers coming back. And the event established that we were well over the age, which we weren't. But we got to Kingsbridge and we walked it from there to Croke Park, like, which was quite a walk for young fellas, you know, with very, very little money. That was the first uh, recollection I have of travelling away to a game, you know, and, and I travelled everywhere to games. Tell me, what was Croke Park like when you went for the first time? Uh, it, was, uh, it was a fine, it was, it was a wonder to me and to all the other people from the country part of the country part of Ireland, you know, it was, there was stands there. There was uh, the Hogan stand. That was the only real stand that was there. The Cusick stand was built on later, and Hill Sixteen was just a hill, you know, with grass growing on it. And the other end, the canal end, was something the same. And uh, it was a great experience going there. A great experience altogether, seeing the crowd and seeing the matches and everything else, like you know and trying to find, to see Michael O'Hare and people, you know, celebrities in the association. It was a wonderful, wonderful thing. Did you need a ticket to go to that match? No, 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 there was no ticket at all. You paid a shilling. A shilling, that's what we paid to go in, to the 1938 Hall Ireland. And uh, it's more than a shilling now, as you know, it's 70 euros for next Sunday. But uh, people then, you'd wonder why people, because at that time, Ireland was a very, very poor country, and the people were very, very poor. And uh, they had very little money for entertainment or socialising, that, that sort of thing. But nevertheless, massive crowds turned up to those uh, games in the early part of the association. And I'm talking about the 1930s now, and early 40s, and that sort of thing. People, nevertheless, they managed the money, you know, to... to uh, to, to, to travel to the games and to, to uh, there was very little travelling by car at that time, it's nearly all by train and buses, you know, local buses, because uh, people didn't have cars at all. You know, I, I, I read in something, I don't know, it was in, in uh, Fitzgerald's History of the GA, which was published in 1917, I, I did get a copy of it years, in later years, and when the GA was formed in, on the 1st of November 1884, nobody in the seven that were there in Hazel's Hotel on that day 
and nobody else throughout the country had an interest in the NGA on the motor car. Not one person, you know. And you take a situation today now where there's thousands and thousands and thousands of cars travelling to all the big games, like, you know, it's particularly the All-Ireland semi-finals and finals and the provincial finals. So the, 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 the uh, I'm rambling a bit now. Not at all, no, no, you're not at all. Yeah. Can you tell me, when you were growing up, Pardon? when you were growing up, when you were going to um, Abbeyside, to the National School, would there have been hurling or football played in the National School when you were going there? No, no, there? no, no, there wasn't. No, hurling, hurling was played in the Abbeyside School in, it began in 1940. When the, 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 uh, the teacher who came there was hurling orientated. His name was Michael Foley. He was a Dungarvan born man and he was a teacher and he was a very nice teacher. He said, but in 1948, when Waterford won the double, the minor and senior double in hurling in Coke Park, we defeated Kilkenny in minor hurling and we defeated Dublin in senior hurling. After that, there were trophies uh, presented to a number of parts of the county uh, for juvenile hurling, to promote hurling, school hurling particularly. And here in Waterford, there was a cheating cup to the very, very famous trophy and a very famous competition. And uh, that was played for in the schools. And that did more for the development and, and the promotion of hurling in the schools than anything ever, that ever happened since. It was, it was a very, very uh, attractive thing and it brought out the parents as well. And uh, one of the ideas of the whole thing was that it would involve parents or it would interest parents and parents drove the children, you know, uh, to the games. Schools were playing against schools all over the county and that sort of thing. And that's how holding began in the schools in Waterford, you know. And would there have been any hurling or football in Dungarvan Technical School when you went there? No, there wasn't. There wasn't. There was schools played in the Dungarvan Christian Brothers schools. Uh, and that was, they were a very, very, uh, very, very hurling orientated schools, were the Christian Brothers. And uh, they played the Dean Ryan Cup and the, all these things, all these uh, competitions. They were involved in them all, and it was, and being able to play hurling and being a good hurler was very helpful in the school because they, they looked after you to make sure that you were, you weren't leaving or that sort of thing. You know, a lot of my friends now, you know, uh, Tom Cunningham, Larson Flynn, and all those people that played with the county, and uh, all these Pat Enright and all these who played with school and the Christian Brothers, they they learned their hurling there, uh, more 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 or less. You know. But the schools have played a, a notorious, you know. And as well as that, now on, on the topic of schools, the GA did an awful lot for the for the schools in Ireland, for the schools and the churches. They helped to build schools and they helped to build churches, and they even helped to build hospitals throughout the country to play tournaments, you know, uh, in the forties and fifties, mostly in the forties, the late thirties, the forties and the fifties, the GA contributed enormously to the building of, of schools and churches. Maybe not the building of them, but the renovation of them. I do know that they built schools. Uh, they helped to build schools in some of the rural parts of Ireland and the rural parts of Waterford as well. And uh, they, they, I know that in Cork particularly, uh, they played an annual tournament for, uh, I, think, I, don't, I can't think of the name of the hospital now but it was a very very famous tournament and all those those uh, tournaments you know they, they, they did generate funds for those very very deserving causes you know and uh, that's probably all forgotten about today but it is something that should be appreciated uh, it isn't it isn't uh, recorded in any way I suppose to what they did but they did enormous amount of you know promotional and enormous amount of uh, fundraising for the for those institutions, the schools and the colleges and the and, and the churches in, in those days. The GA and and the schools and the Catholic Church too were, you know, very, very united and very, very helpful to each other 
in, in the days of the growing up of the association of the GAA. And when you were growing up, Seamus, how prominent was the GAA in Abbeyside when you were growing up? Very, very much so. Very, very much so. You see, it should be mentioned, uh, Regina, that the, the GAA at the beginning, the G, nobody ever appreciates what, what the GAA has done for Ireland, you know, really and truly, because when they began first, when it, when it began uh, after the the, uh, the Hazel Hotel meeting of the famous seven, uh, all the par- every parishes in the country began to take an interest in it, and eventually every parish, uh, certainly every parish in our diocese, and I'm sure the, that is replicated throughout the whole country, uh, played football or hurling, and that gave the parish an identity, you know, and it developed a community spirit, something that was very, very needed, in, in, not in the, just in the association, not just in the parish, but in Ireland. And it did wonders in that regard, that it gave every place an identification. In fact, uh, it made, you could say it made uh, celebrities out of individuals, people who were nobodies, became somebodies, because of their involvement in the GA. And I remember writing one time about the man in the, in, in the small parish who became chairman of a club. He, he became a celebrity for quite a while. And his, 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 uh, his family, you know, were honoured that their dad was, was uh, somebody. And it gave people like that and they gave players uh, something to aim at, you know, something to... Uh, Sort of strive to be on a county team in holding our football, and it improved that. You know, it, it improved the uh, the identity of the club. If if uh, if they did get uh, you know a, a place on the county team, you take. I was speaking about nobodies now, and I'm not being disrespectful to anyone, but you take people like uh, Christy Ring in Cork, you know, and uh, John Dyle into Prairie, and uh, uh, people like John Keane in Warford, Mick Mackey in Limerick, Jimmy Smith in Clare, and in football you had, I know you had Eddie Cairn and Kenny, I'm just talking about Munster now, you had in football, which was the game we played in Kerry, you had great people, you had uh, Mick O'Connell, who was still an icon, and he was one of Ireland's greatest football. Pat Spillane, who was now one of the uh, analysts on the television, and he was a great, great footballer, won many all Ireland's with Kerry. John Joe Sheehy, Jack O'Shea, and people like that, like, who became famous. Famous. They, they, they achieved celebrity status that they'll never, you know, they, they, they'll never uh, surrender or never, never lose. And they'll be remembered for all time in the association. And that's, that's just months now, but that could be replicated throughout the other, other uh, provinces as well. You know, that's what the GA did for people. It gave people an identity, it gave them something to strive for. It, gave, it built communities. When the local club in a parish started, they developed a community spirit, you know. And there were clubs, and there are clubs in every county, and every parish, not in every county, uh, who never won anything, but they kept on playing uh, just as they came back just next year and they tried just as hard and next year and next year. And that sort of, uh, that, that's a manifestation of the spirit of the GA, you know, that they kept on trying, they wanted the part of the GA and the remain part of the GA, regardless of how they, they, they scored or how they survived or how they, you know, how successful or how unsuccessful they were. That's another of the wonderful uh, things that the GA uh, has uh, to boast about, I think. When you were growing up, who, who would have been your heroes of the games? Well, when I was growing up, John Keane, John Keane of Warford. I didn't mention him in that list there now, I think. But he, he was our icon at that time. And you had Charlie Ware, 
He was another great Waterford player. We played full back in the 1938 All Ireland, in which we were beaten. And uh, you had uh, Vin Baston, another great hurler, who refereed in All Ireland final before he won an All Ireland final. And he, he's the only man I think who played, <coughs> who, who refereed in All Ireland final. He is at the sanction before. Before he won an All Ireland at Saint Holding final, and uh, he was an army captain. He was from Passage East, and uh, there was lots of people like that. Now I can't recall all the names at the moment, but John Keane in particular was one of all great men. <coughs> man, Lowry Mar too, Kid Kenny. You know, he was a great, great name around all place at the time. You know, there used to be a kind of a can throw the bars as Lowry Mar and those sorts of things. People just be singing and talking about in schools and that sort of thing. But uh, you talk about the growth of the association. As I said, we had, we had no ground when we started. Not one of all clubs had a ground. Now we have 52 clubs and they all have their own ground. They all have their own pavilions and they all have their own dressing rooms and all that, you know. <clears throat> they all have their own... Uh, they have everything that they want. Some of them have bars, socials and that sort of thing to raise funds and uh, we have uh, <coughs> in our county now I, w I would think that the value of the property owned by the GNR county will reach 40 or 50 million you know and uh, in the whole association throughout the whole association now remember that we started from nothing I said that a billion or a billion and a half would be a fair estimate of the value of the property owned, including Coltrow Park, which is one of the greatest stadiums in the world, you know, and Tullis and all of these places. But that's all about the growth of the GEA and, uh, you know, the uh, way in which it developed. And it developed like tanks to the parish, tanks to the small parishes. That's what the GEA owes to the small parishes of, 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 of the country, not the small parish, the big parish and the small parish. But mostly to the parishes as a unit <coughs> or as a community. I suppose that the GA made a community out of the parish, you know, because it got this spirit of, of uh, rivalry between this parish and that parish and that sort of thing. That was a very, very good thing as well. It was a healthy rivalry, you know. It wasn't, there was never any disastrous effects and that sort of thing uh, because of the extent of the rivalry. Maybe it did buy it over a few times, but that's only natural, I suppose, you know. And who would have been Abbeyside's rivals? Pardon? Who would have been the, the rivals of Abbeyside? The writers? The rival, the rivals. Oh, John Garden, they're all local rivals. They're, they're a, a, a club at the other side of the Colligan River. There's the Colligan River in between. And uh, in that sort of a situation, there would be a very, very keen rivalry. But it was friendly rivalry just the same. There was there was never any animosity or anything, any bitterness like that at all. But when we played each other, there was desperate rivalry between the supporters more so than the players. And uh, we had some great games. And the fact that the rivalry was there was a reason why the standards were that bit better, you know, because you tried to beat the other fellow. That was all part of the of the <coughs> the meaning of the whole thing. Tell me about your first attempts to play hurling and football, when you started to play. When I started to play, there was no training, minor hurling. I was born in 1921, as I have told you, and uh, I, played, I played for two years with a club called Cattle Brewer. They were a football team in Dungarvan, and they were rivals to the Dungarvan club. They were kind of a breakaway group. It was organised by a man named Edward Fitzgerald, Eddie Fitzgerald. He was a plaster by trade. And he had played hurling and football with Don Gavin. He broke away and he had this... I played for two years with them. And I played the third year over age. 18 was the limit then, you know. And you played it over age for a year if you didn't get caught. And they played two years at the same time hurling. Uh, minor hurling for Abbeyside. And at that time, you just did a small amount of training, you know, for the weeks before the match. 
and uh, you went out and you played. If you're beaten, that was the end of it until next year. And that was the way in all the competitions. You see, there was no, uh, there was only minor hurling, uh, junior hurling, and senior hurling, and the same in football. There was only six. Now you, you have under 14, under 12, you have under 12, under 14, under 16, and you have minor, under 18, under 21, junior, intermediate, and senior. You have all those, th all those uh, grades now in Port Codes, Port Hurling and football. And you have intensive training. There's training every night now in all the grounds. In every ground throughout our county, there's training every night. The same players are not training every night, but the different teams, different grades of training. And uh, it's a totally different situation altogether. You know, with the inter-county teams now, it's gone almost professional. You know, the intensity of the training that's been carried on uh, in all counties, in most of the counties anyway, in hurling and football, depending on what part of the country you're in, it's, uh, it's bordering on the professional, you know? And uh, you'd wonder, like, what uh, the whole thing is going to come to in the end. For instance, training now, Regina, in our county, last year, the cost of training the eight, count, we have eight county teams. Most counties have. Every county in Munster has, and as far as I know, except Kerry, uh, inter-county teams. You know, you have minor, under 21, junior and senior in holding and football. The cost to the Warford County Board last year was three quarters of a million, 765,000. That was the cost of training our county teams last year. And I think it will be more this year. And the, the, the difficulties in finding that money by county boards, you know, is not going to continue, I think. Uh, it's not, and that's the same all over the county. There'll Counties now like, uh, I don't know about Kenny, Kenny wouldn't like to be spending that much because they don't have football to that extent, but Cork would be even greater than that. And so would many other counties, with Limerick and maybe Tipperary and many other counties up the country. I don't think that's going to continue, because all that money is raised by voluntary people, you know, who are still an amateur association, and I don't think that's going to, that can be sustained. I think something has to be done, and done fairly soon by Crow Park, to investigate this whole uh, situation about money spent on training. You know, which is becoming, in my view, is becoming outrageous. And uh, that's uh, an aspect of the whole situation that has to be looked at and looked at badly. I think there has been murmurings recently that Paddy Duffy, who was the old Stewart and Christy Coney are expressing concern about this and are going to make proposals about how to deal with it. But that's all in the future. But I think that's something that has to be done, it should have been done long ago maybe. And uh, we did win a Munster final this year, when it's a final season, a hurling final, and our footballers gained promotion in the league. But that's all we've achieved, you know, for all that expense. And the matter of the payment of managers, uh, that's another problem that has to be solved too, because uh, I have no uh, evidence of payments, but uh, you would be suspicious about the amount of time and energy devoted by people who are brought into a county to train the team, and uh, who's paying them. The county board all over the country deny that they're paying managers, you know, but the most managers are not doing it for nothing, they are being paid. It is a fact that in some cases they're being paid by support groups, or they're being paid by the uh, industries and that sort of thing, but it is something that is being looked at now, I know that because there was an announcement from the Central Council two weeks ago that uh, the matter of payment to managers is going to be examined quite soon. Paddy Duffy has announced that, and uh, that would be done. That would probably take care of that. But again, I'm, I'm rambling a bit. And, uh, not at all, not at all. Tell uh, me, when, when you were playing, you played both hurling and football? Yeah. 
everybody in this county, practically everybody, every player in this county is playing hurling and football. And they begin that at juvenile level. You know, uh, there's, uh, on, uh, they play under 12 now. There's competitions now at under 12, under 14, under 15, under 16, under 18, and under 21, and upwards to junior, intermediate, and senior in board codes. <coughs> they continue that. When, when you were playing, you were saying you didn't have a field. Where, where did you train, or whose field did you train in? When I was playing hurling, we trained in, in uh, was Auburn Council property, to the property that's on council. We didn't look for permission, we didn't uh, go to any expense. You provided your own hurley, and uh, you trained for a few nights, maybe five or six nights only, before the game. And that five or six nights might, might be spread over two or three weeks. And uh, you went out and you played the game. If you won, you did a bit of... You, you, your training was a little bit more intense for the next round because everything was on a knockout basis in those years. You know, you, if you're beaten in the first round, you're going until next year in hurling and football, in all grades. There was no back door, there was no anything like that, you know. And uh, that's what we did. We provided our own hurley. We had to buy our own football boots and everything. And you got your mother to make a nix and uh, or buy a nix. And uh, you, you, you did a collection to buy hurling balls, a collection around the village, door to door. I did door to door collection for years and years. And you might raise up to 30, you know, pounds. If you did a very, very extensive collection, you might raise that amount of money. And uh, you, you, the, you, you got them for jerseys. Buying a set of jerseys was an ordeal, it was very, very... Uh, uh, a very, very, to something that demanded a lot of uh, work and everything else collecting the money because you got no sponsorship at that time. You had no, you had no persons that would be willing to give you anything big at that time. You, if you got five shillings, you'd be getting a very, very big amount, you know, in a collection. <coughs> Mine wasn't that all important at all in any of the parishes in the early years of the association. Mine only started in 1927. And it became inter-county in 1928. And we played inter-county in 1929. And we won the All-Ireland in minor hurling in uh, 1929. That was the first All-Ireland hurling final that we won. We won a second one uh, in 1948. And we've won none since in the county. I never made it. I would never be considered as a, a prospect for the county minor hurling team. I did travel as a sub on a minor football team and it was only because another sub pulled out uh, the day before. I went, I travelled to play Clare in Ennis in, in uh, minor football. I didn't play at all, I was a sub. And that was the farthest I ever got up the ladder, you know. And that was 1939, I think. 1939. Tell me, what, what's, what was Abbeyside Club like in those years? Can you... Describe it for me. Uh, I tell you, there was about five or six people, five or six or seven people, adults, interested in the game. And they'd get you together about maybe two or three weeks. They'd enter a team in the championships. They'd affiliate a minor team and a junior team. We had minor and junior hurling. They were the only two grades that we had. And uh, they'd go around there as far as to play and as far as to train. And there was very, very little training done, and I'm absolutely certain at that point now, you know, I can remember it back very, very well. Very little training, very, very little collective training done. You know, you might two or, do two or three nights training uh, in the two weeks before a game. And the people who were running the, the club, they raised the money to affiliate the teams, and they helped to raise money to buy the jerseys, you know, and, it took it took quite a while after that before <clears throat> uh, holidays were supplied to the players, you know. And uh, I I played a junior holding game one day, and I remember I broke my holiday and had to come off the field because I had no other holiday, and I was replaced by a fellow who did have a holiday, and that was the reason he replaced me, you know. And that those sorts of things are happening all over the country. 
And would you have had, uh, would there have been a local hurley maker who would have made the hurls or? No, no, there wasn't. You bought the hurleys in shops. There was shops in Dungarvan or Corns. There was two films that were both Corns in Dungarvan. They sold hurleys. And uh, I don't know of anybody, there was nobody in the county making hurleys. The, the Randalls of Wexford were the suppliers of hurleys when, in, when my club began to develop really as a club in the 30s and 40s. We got all our holidays from, from Randalls of Wexford. In fact, the county team also had Randalls of Wexford or their suppliers of holidays as well. There was a place in Kilkenny too, I can't recall the name of it now. We didn't have any holidays made in Warford, you know, <coughs> at all. And uh, we had to go outside the counties to get them. I also buy, buy them in the shop, you know. Tell me about um, how you became secretary of Abbeyside, that story. Well, uh, uh, the really extraordinary circumstances, uh, Gina. I was at a meeting of the Legion of Mary. So all men were in this Legion of Mary and this group that I was in at Abbeyside. And uh, we met on a night, I know it was a Wednesday night, and the purpose of our meeting was to express sympathy to the family of our presidents, who had died suddenly that morning. And there was only seven or eight of us turned up at the meeting. And it was held in a room uh, in the scouts' den, in Abbeyside, where the, where the fine uh, troop of scouts in, in Abbeyside. And uh, the meeting only lasted several minutes, maybe seven or eight minutes. And uh, after that we left the room. And in the bigger room of the den, there was a meeting of the Abbeyside Holding and Football Club in progress. And uh, I was too embarrassed to walk out through the meeting. So I sat down at the end of the room on my own, at the end of the bench. And within about 10 minutes, I was elected secretary. And I wasn't a member of the club or anything at that time. And because uh, I'd been away and I had returned after about 10 years. And uh, I knew a lot of the people who were at the meeting, there were about 50 at the meeting, I think, and they couldn't get a secretary. And I got elected secretary. Totally and absolutely unexpected. And I didn't want to take the, the, the position at all, but I was persuaded to take it, and I took it. And uh, that was my beginning in the administrative side of, of, of the GEA. I, I became a selector in the club then as well as secretary. And uh, I was involved in negotiating the purchase of a field for the club, which we got in 1959. And I became a selector with the club as well, in minor grade and in senior grade. And uh, at that time we had players who made uh, a big impression with the county in those years. Austin Flynn and Johnny O'Connor and Donald Whelan and... Tom McEnroe and Pat Enright and uh, many, many others uh, at senior grade. And uh, I told them I was leaving out anybody now. So we, we, we kind of, we won a lot of prominence as a club because of the fact that these people were playing uh, with Waterford, uh, with, with the Waterford team who eventually reached the All-Ireland the All in 57. And... Uh, I stayed on the club then until I was elected secretary of the Western Board of the GEA in 1960, on the 6th of January 1960. 1960, I was elected secretary of the Western Board. And uh, as, a mem as, a, as a, a member of the officer of the Western Board, then I was a member of the executive of the county board. And... Uh, I was uh, 11 years later, in 1971, uh, I was persuaded to stand for the position of county secretary, county secretary, because the uh, occupant of the position, Declan Good, uh, who played holding for Warford and uh, all his family did, he had uh, completed 33 years' service as a county secretary and he retired. 
and there was no secretary being elected for the county. And I stood for election, and the secretary of the Eastern Board of the War for Two was Seamus Grant. We were very, very good friends. He also stood, and uh, he he won the election. He defeat he won the on, on a vote of 132 to 128. There's only four votes of a difference. And uh, he he remained in office for 37 years. He died last year, and. Uh, I said I was a member of the executive then, and I have had a lot of positions on the county board. I was in various subcommittees, like the communications committee and uh, the archive. The, the uh, I was in the communications committee. I I was in the uh, board and org. I, I in fact I, I set up board and org in nineteen sixty six in West Warford, and that developed, and I became I remained on as part of that. Uh, for all my years as uh, a divisional board secretary. And tell, tell me about the development of Board Nanog. How did that come about? It came about, there was, uh, it really originated because of the schools uh, at school activities and the interest in starting something uh, positive on a county basis and on an official basis in the county. Uh, Minor, the, the uh, under 16 grade and under maybe under 15 players who had played in school were, you know, who had nothing at all to do, they had no, no outlet for their standards and for their holding and for their interests. And I started it with a group of people, uh, Mihal Kalu, uh, he was one of the great. Uh, teachers who promoted a lot in his school. Another man was Harry Conway, another man was Jim Cullen. Jim Cullen was also a school teacher. And uh, with two or three more, Jamie Maloney, he was chairman of the Western Board at the time. He was also uh, very, very uh, active in helping to promote the thing. But I decided that we would start a competition. We started a competition in 1966 under 16 and uh, it developed from there. The Eastern Board then decided to do the same thing and there was sort of interdivisional competition and it went from strength to strength and today now we've one of the best organisations in that uh, sector uh, as underage juvenile with fantastic people and had fantastic people working all along you know and uh, organising it and Playing uh, in grades from under 12, you know, under 14, under 15, under 16, and up to minor. And they're, they're managing all that now, and uh, they're making a great, great success of it. And you uh, mentioned when it started that a lot of the people involved were, were teachers. They were, and yeah. They what, were. what was it like trying to, I suppose, work with schools? What was the reaction of the schools to it in general? The reaction from the pupils, from the players, is it? Well, from from the players and from the teachers, maybe the schools. Oh, it was class. fantastic! It was absolutely fantastic. I remember one time. I remember in nineteen sixty-seven, there was a Warford man who lived in Armour and who lived in Dublin, and he was a, a an industrialist. Of a, maybe not on a big scale, but he presented with a cup uh, for the under sixteen competition in Warford. His name was Mister Corn. And we travelled to Dublin to accept the this, this shield, you know. And uh, there was five of us went in a car, in, in a taxi, hired car, to Dublin. And we went to uh, a railway cup final. There was a railway cup final on the can't remember who was playing and we came back again. And it must have cost us a lot, an awful lot, about 10 to 20 times more than the, the value of the, of the shield. But that was the, that was the, the trophy. For the competition, and then we decided we'd present medals as well, and we did that. And we have the thing got off to a great start, and it was a tremendous, uh, it has been a tremendous success. You know, last Sunday, now for instance, we won the Tony Forrestal tournament, which is an All Ireland under 14 tournament, and it's played in Welsh Park to commemorate a great fellow. Uh, 
Tony Forrestal, who was killed on his way home from another 21 match with, with uh, a group from Warford. And uh, we won that. It's our second time winning it. And uh, it's a great competition. It's, it's, uh, it's doing wonders for the game of hurling. You see, because they, they, it's a county team. It's not, uh, it's not a club team at all. It's the best 15 uh, players in the county. From your county and all the all the counties in the country who have hurling teams participate, and uh, there's a secondary competition. Then it's not that the the uh, Sunny Welsh tournament, and it's for uh, uh, it's the same under fourteen uh, age limit on it, but it's for a secondary team. It's for a team that uh, where the standards are not quite as good, and uh, that is also played. So, like holding at underage level in Warford has gone way beyond our expectations, improved beyond our expectations. Now we don't have, uh, we did win another 21 All Ireland in 1992, and we won a number of minor uh, provincial titles, but we have never won an All Ireland senior holding title. Out of all that, at the same time, we've never won anything at a senior level. Uh, since 1959, when we uh, when we beat Kilkenny in a replay before 78,000 in Croke Park, and uh, that's uh, the story more or less about juvenile uh, promotion in Warford, juvenile hurling and juvenile football, mostly juvenile hurling. But we have we have we have great people looking after the 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 Hayes group now. You know we have the coaching and games development people are doing wonders uh, for for for, for uh, holding in our county, and I feel that it's not too long before we will sort of make the breakthrough at senior level as a result of all that because we have great holders coming up. Tell me about um, you mentioned that it was. Unexpected that you became secretary of Abbeyside. Yeah. yeah. Tell me about taking on that job and what the job involved, and you know, what your impression of the whole thing was. Well, it became very, very, uh, very, very uh, involved. When I went home, I told my wife, course, that I was. Uh, in fact, I didn't tell her when I went home. I didn't tell her until the following day that I was elected uh, secretary. Uh, she wasn't too pleased about it. But uh, afterwards she became just as much involved as I was and she gave me enormous help. I said all my mothers and my family and she tore weight behind me in it. But it involved an awful lot of, uh, of, of communications, communicating with players and raising funds and uh, meeting people, meeting players and... Uh, Organising training, we all, we, we did uh, organise training, we had to rent fields locally and we did have a chairman then, Michael Fives, who was, was a farmer and who very generously gave us the use of the field for a number of years and uh, we did have one uh, unusual experience and that was in 1957 when I was actually the club. At that time, uh, there was a fair day. You might know it's about fair day. Now, fair day was where cattle and, and uh, horses and pigs and all those animals would be sold uh, in the town. And uh, the, the, this was before the marts were, were uh, established. Cattle marts were established. And people from all over the West Warford and even beyond that, would come from garden. They drive cattle in the night before, and uh, waiting for the fair on the following morning because they all want to be there early. But one in particular, we had a field rented from a lady uh, on Abbey side, and it wasn't a very well protected field. We took on cattle. We took on twenty cattle, and I think we charged five shillings a head for the cattle, and we'd allow them in the field for the night until a man wanted them back in the morning. So we, there was about eight of us there, and we, we, we minded the cattle until they were sitting down 
and we thought very, very contented. We all went home to bed. And the following morning there was a famine and he brought down my door. His cattle were missing. They had escaped out of the field. And I didn't know what in the name of God to do. It was about five o'clock and I got up and I cycled around and I couldn't find them at all. And I was about four hours looking around. And I got two other people that were with me the night before and they went around. And we didn't find them at all. But the farmer had found them and he didn't tell us at all. We didn't get any of the money that we were supposed to get and he didn't tell you. But that was a, an awful uh, scary uh, experience for me, especially. I was visualising the, the having to pay for the cattle and all that sort of thing. But we didn't, any. We didn't ever uh, again uh, engage in that sort of fundraising, you know. And that was, that was 1957. But then we negotiated with, with water field and uh, we, paid, we had to buy two fields, two part fields. And we paid about £660 for it, which was a huge amount of money. We ran a non-stop draw and eventually we, we, we cleared it. We eventually sold that field and bought the field that we were in at the moment. We bought it for 110000 There's about 10 and a half acres, almost 11 acres in it. And we're developing that now. With, you know, we have uh, raised funds and negotiated a big loan with the, with, with the bank, the AIB. And uh, it's in progress at the moment. In fact, it's about three quarters finished now. We have floodlighting now being turned on in a couple of weeks' time. You know, but most of the most of the clubs in our county are progressing in that way. So tell me about um, then moving on to the being to the Waterford, the, the Western Board in Waterford. Yeah, I, I stood for I was I was stood for the position of secretary in nineteen fifty nine, and I was defeated by the the the, the holder of the position. I, I wasn't keen on it at all, but I was kind of pressed by my club to stand for it. And uh, I lost the, the contest. The following year, I won the contest in, in the schoolhouse out in Balmamila, about eight miles away from Abbeyside. And I was elected. And uh, that, was, that was a much bigger responsibility than being secretary of a club. So I was replaced as secretary of the Abbeyside Club then, and I devote all my time, my GA time, to the divisional board and running matches. I had 28 clubs, there's 28 clubs in the division, and uh, they were playing minor and junior and intermediate, holding on football. So organising those uh, all over the West Warford was very time consuming, because at this stage, in 1960, things were beginning to change and uh, you had uh, teams were training more seriously and all clubs were acquiring grounds and that sort of thing and they were able to, you know, to, to have uh, a place to train uh, every night of the week if they wanted. And we had minor and... and uh, We had minor, junior and intermediate. And a few years later, about three years later, we got under 21 going, under 21 holding on football. So it was quite a big uh, undertaking and it was quite very, very time consuming. And then on Sundays you had matches in the field and you had to arrange for gate receipts, gate uh, collection. And uh, arrange that the venues would be prepared for the, for the games. And uh, all that kind of uh, work was involved. The field in Dungarvan, that was the main field. It was called the Shandon Field. That was the main field. And in fact, it was one of the most important Gaelic grounds in Ireland because there was four all Ireland finals played there in the early years. You think Kilkenny and Cork and Tipperary and Cork and Kilkenny and Tipperary as well. There was four played there, four all Ireland finals played there. And it was owned by a family uh, who rented it to us. But eventually we bought it, and I was involved in the negotiations to buy it. We bought it for 40,000. Now you'll be talking about several millions. We bought it in 1972. We bought the, the Shandon Field in Mulgarvan. We named it the Fraher Field, after Dan Fraher, who was a very, very famous personality in the GA. In fact, he was one of the trustees uh, 
in the purchase of Jones's Road, which is now Croke Park. Jones's Road was the ground uh, which was used first of all by the GF for All Ireland uh, finals. And uh, Dan Fraher of Dungarden was one of the trustees. He went security in, in, when they raised the money to buy it by uh, Jones's Road, which eventually became Croke Park, called after Dr. Croke, you know, who was a patient of the association in 1884. And uh, I was one of the people negotiating that. We bought that in 1971, opened it in 19, officially in 1973. And uh, we had that ground with Capital Quinn, Liz Moore, and other uh, really good grounds. That could, and we were confined to those three grounds to play our matches. So you asked me, like, what was it like? It was a very, very busy time being secretary. And tell me, how did things change? You were saying you were secretary of the Western Board for 21 years. And how did the role change in that time? How did the other thing... Well, it, uh, everything developed. More, more, uh, more chapters were added. Uh, you had junior intermediate, you had junior second string then. And that meant that a senior team who had a very, very big... Uh, panel would be allowed to put in a second team at junior level so you had another grade another competition and uh, you had uh, minor you had minor in different grades also you know under 18 and you have a second under 18 team and uh, it, it You had more clubs coming in then. You, you had clubs originally when I was, became secretary of the Western Board. You had clubs who might just have a journal football team. And, or, or maybe a, a journal hurling team. Maybe just one of them. But as time passed by and they, you know, they developed, they also entered minor teams and second teams, under 21 teams. And the, the thing became kind of... Uh, it built up to to, uh, to a situation where uh, it demanded an awful lot of uh, time to to uh, it required an awful lot of time to to, to uh, manage the whole thing, and then uh, the all all the, all the competitions of course were planned on a knockout basis at that time. They were all on a knockout basis. But then they began this thing about getting a losers group. That a team beaten in the first round, all the teams beaten in first rounds, would play in the losers group, and the winners of the losers group would go back into the championship, and uh, at the semi final, the quarter final stage, or something like that. And that increased the activity, and increased demand for time. When I became secretary of the Western Board, I didn't, I didn't have a telephone. I didn't have a telephone for many years afterwards because uh, there was uh, no very little funds in the thing. It wasn't uh, a very uh, well uh, financed uh, outfit at all. In fact, there was an honorarium of £50 a year that the secretary got. But you found us spending most of that on a whole lot of things. And there wasn't much money to, you know, telephones and that sort of thing. Uh, you didn't take any expenses for telephones. And I didn't have a car either for about 10 years afterwards. And you had to hire a taxi to go here, there and everywhere. But there were problems, all right. But you know what, this, I enjoyed it. And I'm delighted now that I'd stayed with it. And that's, I, you know, and that's, I uh, was a part of it all. Because I met wonderful, wonderful, wonderful people. Wonderful people. And looking back now, I'd be amazed at the, their contribution and the amount of time they devoted to it and all they put into it, you know. And uh, there was no question of getting expenses or getting anything like that at all. No question whatsoever. And they were wonderful, wonderful, wonderfully dedicated people. You know, you'd have your rows, all that sort of thing, you'd have your differences and you'd have objections and they'd be bad feeling for a little while and that sort of thing. But that was all uh, passed over. That all... all, all dissipated in, in, as time went by. You know, I really enjoyed that 21 years of 
activity. But you, I, I was home every every Sunday, every every Sunday, you know. And you mentioned there that you didn't have a phone or a car at the beginning of that. Yes. And in 1960, when I was elected. And how? what about, I suppose, how technology developed in terms of writing letters to clubs or photocopiers or all of that sort of thing? Did that make a difference in your... Yeah, I, 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 uh, there was no technology at all at all then, at that time. But I, I eventually uh, bought a second-hand typewriter and I typed letters and... Uh, I then bought a copier, and I copied the letters. You know, and you put on Dear John, but you, play, you don't do Dear Anybody. And you just put in the name Athwell, you just had a call out at the end of it. You had to put that in after, after they're being copied, and then post them out. Because uh, having a telephone wasn't a, a, an enormous disadvantage, because the other people haven't telephones either. You know, you couldn't telephone somebody, uh, because very, very few of the people that I was dealing with had telephones either. I would say nearly when I started, I'd say none of them had a telephone, and that's only fifty years ago. But that was the situation then. I got a telephone then, and uh, I uh, gradually other people got telephones. Somebody in the club would have a telephone. You telephoned them, you know. But that wasn't totally reliable because you would be supposed to communicate with the secretary, and I did have a little difficulties there that you'd communicate with somebody in the club, and he wouldn't pass on the message. And, well, he would, but he denied afterwards if it was convenient for the club not to know that they had an appointment or something like that. But at that time, too, we had an awful lot of objections. They, they were the norm. Every club that would lose a game were looking for an objection. And we had a lot of objections that were, were flimsy or, or, or submissions of, uh, about the, the uh, illegality of the opposition, you know. And uh, that might be that they filled in the team sheet, they didn't spell someone's name in Irish properly, it's not little things like that, but you had to hear the objection, and the objection were held at meetings of the board, and you often had uproar at meetings when fellas wouldn't get their way and that sort of thing, and it was very uh, unethical, I suppose, a very, very uh, undignified behaviour at times, you know, you'd have meetings and you'd hate the thought of having to go to the meetings and arguing and that sort of thing. That was all part of the, the game. Do any objections stand out in your mind over that period? There was a famous Maid of Vale, they called it, they still talk about the Maid of Vale uh, objection. And uh, that was, a, a, it was in 1949, before I became secretary of the board. And my own club were involved. And they played uh, a football match and they had seven illegal players. Seven of them weren't registered and the seven of them were illegal. And they, were obje- they won the, no, they lost the match, but they objected. And they won the match. They won the objection because of a technicality and the submission of the thing by the other, the opposition. And... Uh, Then the other people appealed to the county board on the grounds that the Abbeyside uh, team submitted the names of their players on a paper that wasn't Irish watermarked. And that, in those days the paper had to be Irish watermarked. And uh, the, the, there was no evidence that the paper was watermarked. But Abbeyside got, uh, got, Abbeyside got a printer, Drunkhaven Leader in fact, Printing Works, the editor of that, proved that the paper was uh, Irish watermarked. And that's, uh, he said that the paper, where the paper was cut, didn't include the watermark. But he showed, he, he came into the meeting and he proved that the that the thing was out. That was a famous objection in West Warford, a very, very famous objection. They called it the Made of Ale objection. There were lots of objections like that. I can't recall them all. There were so many of them, I, I, I can't recall uh, many of them in, in, individually. 
But there was always people playing with, the fellow would play with the club and the club might be beaten in the first round, he'd go in, he'd play in a different part of the division with somebody else. And uh, in the same championship, you know, that was happening too. You mentioned um, the Irish language there and writing the team lists in Irish. Um, yeah. would, would, was there much Irish used in a GAA administration in your time on the West Board? No, th- there was quite a lot more than there is now. There's no Irish used now at all at all in, in, in GAA fields. They do supply, supply the names in Irish all right, but apart from that, at that time, in my time, uh, there would be quite an amount of Irish used. But uh, the secretary of the club, you know, would usually be able to do his business uh, in Irish. He'd be, uh, he'd be able to supply the list of players in Irish, and he'd be able to write to the secretary, to me, the board secretary, and address the envelope in Irish, you know, and sign his name in Irish. If he didn't sign his name in Irish, the document was illegal, you know. Or if he didn't address the envelope in Irish, the... Uh, the, the, the submission was illegal. It couldn't be dealt with. It was out of order if it wasn't in Irish. You know, that's uh, that's not enforced anymore now. And one of the reasons, one of the many reasons it's not enforced, because the GNO is very strong in Britain and America and Australia and those people, like, and you can't use Irish there. And uh, you, you can't have different rules everywhere, you know. They... they the more widespread the GA comes, the more it spreads its wings, if you like, uh, the more liberal the rules are becoming, you know. And uh, now that there, there's uh, you don't have to be absolutely deadly accurate. For instance, if you uh, submit an objection and you don't quote the right rule, now uh, your your objection wouldn't be thrown out. If you if you if you quote the rule that has a connection with the subject of the objection, you know, it's, it's acceptable. Once upon a time, if, you'd, if you didn't dot an I or cross the T or something like that, they'd, they'd submit an objection on that basis. But there's very, very few objections now, either inter-county, never, there's never an inter-county objection now, in fact, and there's very, very rarely you have an objection at county or divisional board level. I think in my, in my memory now in the county here in Warford, we didn't have an objection for years and years and years. And in my time, you'd have a, you could have to have 30 in a year, you know, in, in a division, and maybe the same in the other division. But you'd never, never have an objection, no. The, the, uh, I suppose the outlook is different now. They go out and play, and if they win, they win, if they lose, they lose. And they're not sort of that much into uh, getting advantage over a club on paper. They want to win it on the field. You mentioned the the Irish watermark and and I suppose the Irish language as well. In that time, to what extent was the GAA sort of an Irish cultural movement or a, a nationalist movement? Yeah, it was more cultural and more nationalist. I say uh, it was a great degree more national in its outlook, and uh, than it is now, and. Uh, there was a, a greater uh, emphasis on, on uh, promoting Irish culture in many ways, like, you know, at that time. Uh, there was Cayleys were held, and, you know, clubs held Cayleys. You couldn't hold a dance. If you held an English dance, you'd be suspended. Your club would be suspended to raise funds, you know. And uh, we had players, we had inter-county players suspended, you know, for attending rugby dances. And soccer dances, dances promoted by those uh, organisations, you know, to, to promote their their their, uh, their games, and uh, but that's all gone now, you know. There's there's from a nationalist point of view, uh, there's very very little uh, emphasis now on culture, Irish culture, or the Irish language. It has changed. Sadly, it has uh, it has. Uh, sort of fades away out of the whole equation, you know, the promotion of, of Irish culture and Irish 
dancing and everything else. You never have KDs now at all, you know. You have clubs now holding dances and they hold all sorts of things to, to raise funds. But there's no question of they have to be of an Irish or involved in at least or, or in some way to show uh, an Irish cultural involvement at all. That old thing, that scene has changed completely now, uh, Regina, altogether. Seamus, do you mind if we just take a quick break there for a second? Right. Okay, Seamus, so we were talking about, I suppose, things Irish and the GAA is sort of an Irish Ireland movement, really. Um, you would have been in the Western board around the time the ban was lifted on, on foreign games. Can you talk a little bit about that, maybe? Yeah, I was. I was in that. Uh... I was in office when the the, uh, the band the band was there of course for, for uh, the band was there for seventy eighty years I suppose and the band on playing or promoting or looking at uh, fun games mostly soccer of course and uh, rugby like th- these were the only fun games and they were called fun games that were played in Ireland or promoted in Ireland and. Uh, during the, during the existence of the band, many, many players, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of players, were suspended for uh, going to matches, or playing the matches, and people were told they were living a lie. You know, people who had gone to see a rugby match or a soccer match, or gone to a rugby dance or something like that, and didn't tell anybody about it. Uh, you know, they, they were... Uh, they were entitled, or whatever you like, to a suspension, and uh, nobody knew about there couldn't be a suspension. And in that case, they were told they were living a lie. But as time went on, uh, there was a movement to uh, dispose of the ro- rule, Rule Twenty Seven. That was the rule, the famous rule or the infamous rule, whichever you like. And uh, there was several uh, campaigns started. But they kind of died before they got to Congress. But there was one particular man in Dublin, Tom Wolfe, who was closely identified with the removal of the ban rule. And he, he was agitating for it. He was campaigning for it. And uh, as a matter of fact, his campaign, I think, I could right to say that it turned into a crusade. The amount of, uh, of uh, canvassing he had done for the removal of the ban. And... There were many, many people in Ireland, a very, very big portion of the J in favour of the ban. And of course there was very, very many people against the ban. The people against the ban were the younger people, you know, and uh, that was obvious, I suppose. But anyway, the, the motion reached Congress, the Dublin County Board motion reached Congress. Tom Wolfe was the Dublin County Board member. It reached Congress in 1971. And... An extraordinary thing about it was that Pat Fanning, the waterman, who was a great president, he was in office and he was here to handle this debate. And the debate was very, very divisive, very, very divisive. And uh, there, was, there was a lot of, a huge amount of publicity given by the media, uh, mostly the print media uh, at the time, and there was speculation as to how it would work out. But Pat Fanning was known uh, as uh, a supporter of the band and a believer in everything Irish. He was a great Irish man, a fantastic Irish man, a great man in Irish culture. And he didn't want it removed at all. But he, he was the man who had to sit in the middle. And the Congress that year was held in the Queen's uh, Hall in Belfast. I was at the Congress. And it was, it was, uh, there was lots of speculation about how it would resolve, how it would uh, turn out, you know, and there was a lot of speculation about how Fanning would behave in the whole thing. But anyway, it was, uh, as the day came close, it looked as if it would be removed. And it was removed by a fairly substantial majority. The motion to remove the ban was carried. And uh, one of the things that came out of it was that Fanning's handling, his masterful handling of the debate... He didn't allow any divisiveness or any aggro or anything like that to uh, 
spoil the 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 bait in in the Queen's Hall, and uh, he he's that was one of the things that was uh, publicised very well in the following days and weeks and years, as a matter of fact, was the merciful way in which he handled the bait. There was no divisiveness, no arguing, or no uh, crossness or anything like that, no ugliness at all. And I remember well on the following day, uh, <clears throat> remember when it was held in the Queen's University in, 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 in Belfast, and there was a photograph of Fanny. Uh, Stanley, he was sitting in, in the President's chair, he was the President's chair at the time, and he had his specs held out in his hand like that. And over his head at the back was a photograph or a big picture of Queen Elizabeth. You know, I suppose that was, uh, it was very, very pointed. That's, uh, I don't think it was intended that he would be sitting there or nothing like that at all. But it just happened that the Queen of England was sitting over Fanning's head when he was uh, handling this particular uh, controversial, the most controversial the base that had ever been held in the association up to that point, up to 1971. Can you well, tell me a little bit about the, the atmosphere in the room that day? Huh? Can you tell me a little bit about what was the atmosphere like in the room that day when the debate was happening? Uh, it was very divisive. You see, we had a very good idea of how it was going to go because some counties were... <clears throat> all counties, every one of the 32 counties and the counties of Britain and outside Britain, uh, who had been debating as to how they should vote on it, their intentions were known, and it was known going in there that it was very, very likely going to be passed. But there was an awful lot of speculation, and there was an awful lot of tension in, in the room, in the delegates. There was about 300 delegates, and uh, there was a massive amount of media, because this was a huge uh, step for the association, one way or the other, and uh, there was there, there was uh, there was huge tension like that, and there, but there wasn't any bitterness. And immediately that the result was announced, uh, it was it was uh, taken in a hand show, a hand show, you know, show of hands, and immediately it was announced. There was uh, applause by the people, the supporters. And there was, of course, no support from the people who were against it. But everybody took it very, very well. There was nobody bad friends, no one at all bad friends after it, you know. But what was very important, very, very important in relation to the removal of the ban, and Pat Fanning saw that uh, before the debate started at all, was that he said that the, the property of the association, that the fields held by clubs and everything else, had to be... Uh, guarded, you know, from takeover by, by soccer and rugby clubs who might now want to play their matches in our grounds. And he pointed out, of course, and rightly so, that if that happened, uh, the association had lost everything that it stood for. And as well as that, it would mean that soccer and rugby could be played on our grounds, but we couldn't play hurling and football on their grounds because they were too small. They are two separate games, three separate games. And rugby or soccer couldn't be played, could be played on a Gaelic ground. But hurling and football, who was had to play on a field of different dimensions, of course, couldn't play on their ground, you know. But anyway, he said he was going to bring in a new charter that would protect our grounds from takeover or from use by any other uh, organisation. And he did that. And he, he, he McNamee, who had been a former uh, president, uh, he appointed him as chairman of a committee, and that committee brought out the McNamee report, <clears throat> and that embraced all the problems that might arise, and, and that, that was brilliant thinking on his part, you know, and it safeguarded all everything that the, the uh, association, the association owned. But I would, would like to say this much: I was, I was in favour of attaining the ban. And uh, was in favour of attaining the ban. But it was inevitable that it would have to go, that it would have to be abolished because of the advent of television and radio. And matches were televised, soccer matches were being televised, and rugby matches were being televised. 
And at that stage, most people had a television. And you just couldn't go into your living room and turn off the television when the soccer match was on, you know. And you could look at it at home in the comfort of your living room. And you couldn't look at it in the field that might be, you know, 100 yards away. So it had to be abolished. And like looking back on it now with the, with the, with the coverage, the massive exposure that soccer is getting, you know, and rugby from the, uh, by, cost, by, by, by virtue of television, uh, it would be absolutely impossible to implement it now, you know. And uh, it passed off like that. And there's no, there's no business about it now. And it's all over and I done with. But it was the most controversial rule, I suppose, that we did have uh, up to that point. It was certainly the most controversial rule that has uh, disturbed the, the, the whole association. But it passed off splendidly. And again, I said so that, it, that was due to the merciful handling of Pat Fannin. How effectively was the ban implemented in Waterford before it was lifted? It was... Uh, I, I could name dozens of people that were suspended for playing soccer. Mostly soccer. Rugby wasn't played that much anymore. But mostly soccer. And people going through the matches and people uh, playing matches. You know, playing soccer matches. As a matter of fact, we had a lot of people in, in the Dungarvan area, in this part of West Walkwood, suspended. You know, they had vigilantes, uh, county boards appointed people to watch uh, big games, particularly games. There was Kilcoman Park in Walford now was the venue for the soccer matches in Walford, the big soccer matches. And vigilantes would visit that, they'd stay outside the stadium and see who was going in. And if they identified people then who were which clubs or members of clubs or could be identified in any way with the association in Warford, they reported them and they were suspended. And there was a lot of bitterness over that, an awful lot of bitterness. And that, as I said, could be replicated throughout the whole country. You know, it, it, did, it, did, it did create uh, bitterness and it was getting worse and worse and worse. And in the end, the counties found it difficult to get vigilantes, you know, because they were branded, you know, as being uh, so and so, and nobody liked that name. And eventually, uh, if it hadn't been changed, I don't know what would have happened. Because, uh, you know, it, 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 there would have been breaches of the, of the road, Road 27, it was, in every club. And it would have been silly in the long run to maintain the ban or sustain the ban because of the exposure getting on, on, on television and that sort of thing. And uh, young players then were getting very uh, interested in soccer, particularly if they were beaten in the championships, for some of the championships or something like that. They had nothing else to do when they played soccer. And you could play soccer on the green or play it anywhere at all. You didn't have to have a proper, uh, you know, marked ground or anything like that for it. So... Uh, while it was uh, intended, uh, the role was intended as a means of uh, getting people to play Gaelic games only and to reserve that sort of a, uh, that's an uh, element of Irish culture. You know, it was a very, very good idea, but it, wouldn't, it couldn't possibly have been continued, you know, and planning it was the right thing to do, or at least changing the rule was the right thing to do. You mentioned that at the time you were you would have been in favour of retaining the ban. What was what were your concerns about the ban being lifted? That's a very very good question, no, Regina. Uh, I, I can't say really and truly, and I say a lot of people would be the same same way that that that. Uh, they hadn't absolutely solid reasons for uh, opposing the ban. You know, uh, I suppose the idea was, we, we, I, I, my, my, my point of view, as an officer on the board, I, I was keen on holding all people and stopping objections and getting people to stay with the, with, with the games. Because there was, a, a, here and there, there were soccer clubs uh, being... Uh, established, you know, 
and being an officer of the board, I suppose, I felt that they were the opposition, you know, and you always go against the opposition. I said that was my reason for the, the, the ban, for opposing the ban. I'm sorry for supporting the ban. And lots of other people had the same ideas, you know. There were people who were solidly, absolutely solidly uh, in favour of retaining the ban. The cost was firm. You know, there were that people who took a very nationalistic view of the whole thing and wanted uh, nothing only Irish. You know, nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing only Irish. You know, I was, I was uh, a secretary of my club. I was reprimanded by a member of my committee for uh, asking for a quotation for a set of jerseys from a Protestant establishment one time. Now that wasn't the, the, the that wasn't supported by the committee, but a member of my committee did that. He said I should be reprimanded, reprimanded for asking uh, a Protestant establishment to give a quotation for set of holding jerseys. You know, you had that kind of people and fair play to them, that was their outlook and that was their eyes and that's how they, they looked and that's how they wanted things. And uh, you had people like that all along, very, very nationalistic in their outlook and they, they were in favour of retaining the ban. Would there have been many Protestants involved in the GAA in Waterford in those years? I don't think it made any difference much. We, we had, I, don't, I don't think we had any Protestants playing with us. But we did have Protestants playing uh, throughout the county and throughout the divisions. But they were just as Irish and just as good in every way, you know, and just as committed and just as supportive of the rules of the association as anybody else. It didn't make any difference whatsoever. The religious, uh, you know, the different, the different uh, religious beliefs, I, I won't think it was a factor at all, ever, you know. In terms of, of, of Rule 27, did you ever think that it was, it was damaging to the association in any way? To be honest about that, the answer to that question, I don't think it was damaging. You know, it was damaging in that uh, people were being suspended. But the playing of soccer and the playing of rugby wasn't, wasn't taking anything from the GEA. Any more than it is today. In fact, GA is stronger, stronger now than soccer, rugby, far, far stronger. And there's absolutely no threat from these sports or organisations anymore. You know, the GA is going stronger and stronger and stronger. And uh, soccer, for instance, like real soccer or soccer at the higher level, that's an industry. GA is a sport. Soccer is an industry, that's what it is, and there's no other way to describe it. Because it's uh, every player playing soccer as, uh, at the middle level or the top level, he, he, the aim of that person is, is the, of that player is to, you know, to gain more and more uh, uh, financial reward, you know, for playing. Because that is his, because you're here. Every time at this time of the year in, in soccer, when there was, uh, the, new, the new competitions are starting and players are transferring, and that is all about money. You know, the GA is not about money, not, not yet anyway. Tell me, about, um, tell me about how your administrative career continued from the Western Board onto Central Council. Yeah. Uh, I was elected, I don't know if I told you that, I was elected uh, onto the Central Council, Donald Whedon. He, was, he, he won an All-Ireland with Warford. He won a minor All-Ireland in 1948 and he won a senior All-Ireland in 1959 when Warford defeated Ken Kenny in our last All-Ireland victory, unfortunately. And uh, he was uh, elected trustee of the association. And that, he, he had been a member of Central Council. And that left a vacancy for a Warford representative on Central Council. And the Warford County Board then had to hold an election 
and elect a replacement for Donald Whelan. I was still secretary of the Western Board at the time, in 1979, and I was elected. And uh, there was a three-way contest, and I took my place then on the Central Council in 1979, the same year as Lee Mulville came in as Old Shore Hall. Lee Mulville, Lee Mulville, he was the Old Shore Hall for 30 years, and he, he was the Old Shore Hall, and I was not sat on that on the. Leinster Council, I think as we ever called, uh, Con Murphy was uh, the president and he was one of 11 presidents that I, I uh, sat under on Leather Tad from the uh, Central Council uh, last week. I think I can even name Con Murphy was there, Paddy McFlynn was the next one and then Paddy Boggy from Kilkenny, and then uh, Mick Loftus from Mayo, and then John Dowling of uh, Offaly, and finally John Dowling of Offaly, uh, they had Joe McDonough from Galway, and then we had uh, Sean McCaig from uh, Manhattan, and Sean Kelly followed him, Sean Kelly of Kerry, and then we had uh, Nicky Brennan, and now we have Christy Coney of Cork. Those were, those were the presidents while I was on the Central Council from 1979 until, until this year, until Congress this year in Newcastle and County Down. And uh, I worked very well with them all, I thought they were all very, very fine people. They were all, some of them had more difficult terms than others, you know, uh, nothing controversial happened during some of the President's uh, terms of office. Others did have big problems when they had to handle uh, matters like the uh, the controversial change over uh, from the ban, as we've been talking about, to a motion calling for the GA to allow rugby and, rugby and soccer to be played in Croke Park. Uh, the stadium had been developed now and it was uh, a case of rugby and soccer had no place to play because Lansdowne Road was being redeveloped and it would take three and a half or four years. And during that time, if uh, Ireland were playing uh, soccer or, or rugby in the internationals uh, against uh, England or something like that, they would have had to go to the country to play the game. So there was a mighty campaign started to allow rugby and soccer to be played in Croke Park, and Croke Park only. This would not apply now to other grounds throughout the country, or other stadiums in the country. But uh, there was a huge campaign started uh, in favour of it. And it kind of started silently, there was nobody, there was no leader in it. Now, I suppose it could be said that Sean Kelly played a lead role in uh, getting uh, the whole thing aired and the reasons for it. For, for the the reasons for giving uh, permission to rugby and soccer to play their games in the stadium and uh, the, the campaign started anyway and there was a special congress held and a vote was taken and it was passed and uh, it wasn't passed by, it required a two-thirds majority it got a two-thirds majority and little with it after it was passed and that meant that you had uh, rugby and soccer in Coke Park. Now, against that, or at least in favour of it, it must be said that it generates enormous uh, revenue for the association. It's something in the region of 50 million up to now. Um, that money was uh, splendidly uh, distributed throughout the association. It came from... Uh, Pro provincial councils got uh, a huge amount of it, uh, counties got a huge amount of it, and every county as well got a quarter of a million to allow 10 clubs in each county to get 25,000 uh, for development of some kind. But all of the money, with the exception, I say about 95% of the money that was generated from the playing rugby and soccer in Croke Park 
uh, there was the commercial side of it as well as the rent. We got the rent for the games. And as well as that, we got uh, a lot of commercial revenue, sale of drink and food and all that sort of thing in the stadium where those games were in progress. And advertising and television and everything like that. We got a lot of revenue. I say a uh, rough figure would be 50 million. And uh, each of the provinces got money and each of the 32 counties got money. Uh, all the 32 counties got a million. And that was 32 million. The, there was 8 million distributed to, to clubs. That was uh, Uh, ten, ten, 10 clubs in each county getting a quarter of a million for development or purchase of the, the uh, setting up of uh, flood lighting or for uh, all weather pitches or that sort of thing. So, so the money was splendidly spent and to the godsend really and truly in that sense you know why people still don't go there and uh, it also earned an awful lot of goodwill for the GEA that the other associations like soccer and rugby didn't have to leave the country to play their own pop matches. And there was an enormous amount of goodwill, you know, came from that decision. And uh, while there were some people very, very bitter about it and very, very uh, saddened by the fact that rugby and soccer were played there because of the fact that the association in 1884 was set up to promote Irish games only. But that's how it is and that's how it stands now. And uh, the uh, the association did benefit enormously from it. Now none of the money that was raised was uh, except the, the, the a very very small amount of the commercial side of things was given to Croke Park. You know, it was given to for the association as a whole, and it was very welcomed everywhere, and uh, very, very well spent, I must say. How, how did you feel about it personally? How did I feel about... The, the opening of Crow Park? I was against it. Personally, I was against it. But uh, my county board decided to vote in favour of it, and I then voted with the county. I didn't have to vote for the county, but there was pressure put on me to uh, vote in the same way as the county. As a member of Central Council, I would have voted on my own. I was a member of the council rather than a member of the county board when I was elected on although I was still a member of the executive in the county board. But I, I, uh, I, I was afraid of it. You know, I was afraid of what it would, uh, what would follow. I was afraid that... That was the, the uh, tin end of the wedge, and that eventually soccer and rugby were played in all games throughout the country. Throughout the country. But that's, there was a pledge that that would not be entertained under any circumstances, and that pledge, I suppose, would be maintained. And I, I think it will be maintained. But I was worried at the time. But I did vote in favour of it. You know? And you say you were put under pressure to kind of vote along Washford lines. What, what, what do you mean? Say that again. You, you were saying that you were kind of put under pressure to vote along Waterford county lines. Yeah, to vote county board. Yeah, to vote with the county board. Okay. Yeah, well, I suppose, and um, rightly so, maybe, because a county would expect a their representative on, on the council to vote with the... Uh, with the county board. You see, Central Council didn't take any uh, decision to go for or against it. The Central Council as a body now, the 47 of us on Central Council, uh, was free to vote in whatever we liked, you know. And uh, some members of Central Council did vote against it and some voted for it, you know. But uh, Sean Kelly, who was president of the GEA at the time, he was undoubtedly in favour of it. You know, and uh, some people say that he played a lead role in, in the promotion of the campaign to get the thing uh, uh, go through. And uh, I think that is true, that he was in favour of it. And uh, he might have regarded it as a victory for his term as, as a president. 
att det skulle kunna få när jag tänkte att Sean O'Donoghue var den människa för sport in Ireland. He, he was very pleased that the motion was passed. He was at the, uh, the Congress that day and uh, I spoke to him afterwards and I, I'm totally satisfied that he was very, very happy that the thing was, 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 uh, was passed. It was only passed by a small majority, but it was a two-thirds majority. And uh, that was that then, and that's, that's where it stands at the moment. That, uh, that is, and it was extended then for about two years because there was a delay in the completion of uh, Lansdowne Road. That is now completed and matches have been played out this year. So it's unlikely that we will ever again have uh, games played in Coke Park, but you don't know. Their, their stadium is limited to 52,000. Coke Park will, it will accommodate 82,000. That's a massive difference, 30,000. More would fit in Coke Park, and uh, you wouldn't know they may be tempted in the future if there's a very, very important game, international game between Ireland and England in rugby or soccer, that they might still want to go for Coke Park. Can you tell me about some of the discussions maybe that were had in Central Council about the opening up of Croke Park? Was it discussed widely? Was it a was it what? Was it was it wide, widely discussed in in Central Council the opening of Croke Park? No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. It was. Uh, it wasn't the. the uh, it was, was a motion in, and and uh, there was a matter of whether or not it required a two thirds majority, but it did uh, require a two thirds majority, and legal 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 uh, advice was obtained on that. Central Council didn't uh, go one way or the other in favour of it or against it. They weren't involved. It was left to the clubs. The clubs in each county met and they advised the county board how their delegates, through their delegates, as to what way they wanted it. And that was, that was the, the, the replication all over the 32 counties. And, and uh, each county took a democratic decision and it was a democratic decision of the association to allow uh, the, these games to be played in Coke Park. It was a major change of policy, no doubt in the world about it. But again, it was, uh, uh, you know, an illustration, I suppose, of the way things are changing, the whole world is changing, and uh, organisations are changing with it. And, you know, no matter how long something is there, it will change eventually. If enough people wanted to change, you know. So that it's their now and it's there to stay. That Central Council now have the right to give permission to rugby and soccer to play games in Crow Park if there is an application. Up to that point, Central Council didn't have the right, it was only Congress, that means the full association, you know, the entire association. Uh, that means with delegates from every county. That body was the only body who had the right to decide uh, if soccer or rugby could be played in Coke Park. You, you saw a lot of changes, I'd say, in your time on, on Central Council. You would also have been there during the development of, of Croke Park itself. Well, I was. I think, as I told you, I was on the management committee uh, with uh, John Downey with the President and Lee Mulville was the old Stura Hall when we decided to redevelop part of Croke Park. I think it was 1990, and uh, that meant the replacement of the Cusick Stand. Cusick Stand was kind of outlived its its life and needed to be replaced. And it was a matter of 50, 33 million. That was the figure. 33 million. That would cost. And we were very, very worried about the cost. And uh, we debated and debated and debated. Anyway, we eventually decided that we would proceed with uh, an investigation in, in, into the possibility of replacing it. And one of the things that was very, very necessary, in fact, was absolutely vital, before we could develop uh, Croke Park or attempt to replace the Cusick stand, we would have to acquire 
uh, land from Belvedere College, which was behind Crow Park. Now, Belvedere College was a rugby college and had a rugby ground there, and it was about four acres, little more than four acres. We would have to buy that, otherwise we couldn't build the stands because we couldn't have land behind it as well. All the whole complex needed Belvedere playing ground from the Jesuits. And we were negotiating with them and that was an enormous uh, difficulty. It, provided, uh, it presented an enormous difficulty uh, getting land from the uh, from, from Belvedere and from the Jesuits. And we on the management committee were uh, uh, as a loss to know what kind of money they'd be looking for. So we engaged uh, uh, a land agent who was a, a very professional man, a very, very good man, and he was working for us. And uh, all the members of the, of the management committee separately had a figure in their mind. I spent about two or three weeks now and I, I discussed the, the value of the land that they had. And uh, other members of the Central Council of, of Management, he did the same thing. And uh, I was, by my estimate, following discussions I had with people who were knowledgeable about the, that type of business, I, I was prepared to offer £100,000, which was pounds at the time, for the four acres. I, I thought it was too much, in fact. And... Uh, other members of the Managing Committee had their own figures. And, but anyway, when I gave my figure, when I proposed my figure, uh, John Dowling, the President, uh, said to me, he said, you're way out of it, he said. You're way out of it, O'Brien, he said. We've already offered them 500,000. And it was to get lost. You know? But eventually, anyway, we, we did buy it. And it cost us something nearly 2 million, I think because we had to buy land for them, and it was very, very complicated, but it was a very, very, very costly thing. And the, the, the overall cost of uh, the rebuilding of Cusley Stand was in excess of, I think, 35 million. But by this time it was, it was uh, underway. Peter Quinn came on board as president. John Dowling had served his three years, and he was... Uh, he was retired then and Peter Quinn was in and Peter Quinn was a very, very well-known, a very shrewd businessman. And uh, he was one of the Sean Quinn group, but Peter was a very, very good businessman. And we then took a decision and we redeveloped the entire stadium. Redeveloped the Canal End, which is now the Daddon Stand area, and we replaced the, uh, the Hogan Stand and put a second tier on it, and then we develop Hill 16. We wouldn't develop Hill 16, we'd leave it as a standing area. But the whole thing would cost a huge amount of money, and uh, we, we, uh, we worried and worried and worried about that. But we decided on the, the advisors, the architects, and those people that said that it would cost in the re over 200 million. And, uh, they decide that the sale of corporate boxes and premier seating and that sort of thing would be a very, very big help. Uh, companies could buy a 10-year ticket or a 5-year ticket and individuals could buy a 10-year ticket and we would generate a lot of funds in that uh, way. We'd also ask the government for uh, a healthy, uh, financial help on it and we decided to proceed anyway. But we did decide to proceed and... The whole operation cost about uh, 230 million, roughly 330 million. And the help we got from the government, uh, we got about, uh, I think we got about 70 million or something like that from the government at different stages. There was very generous help now from the government, from government funding and uh, from the lottery funding. But it must be remembered in that context too, like there was a lot of uh, publicity about the generosity of the Minister for Finance and the government in general in giving the GA a lot of money. Like it should be remembered that in the overall, 
we paid nearly 60 million in VAT to the government for the building of uh, rebuilding of Crow Park, you know. And uh, I'm not saying that in any way now that the government didn't give us a whole lot of money, but they did. But uh, nevertheless, it's a point that was kind of overlooked, you know, a, a lot. And uh, the, the sale of corporate boxes and premier seating and all that sort of thing. But now we're in a situation that the, uh, the stadium is practically paid for. There's only a very, very small amount due now on, on the stadium. And the attendance is at Crow Park are up very, very well. And the huge amount of uh, income from uh, rent that the Crow Park company gets from the uh, revenue generated by all our fans and semi finals and National League finals and all that is, is bringing down. So down all of North Crow, I think, to around about 20 million. And uh, you see, Crow Park Limited, it's Crow Park Limited. That's a separate uh, entity from. Uh, from, from Central Council. The stadium is operated, is, is run by uh, a company. Peter Kenny is the, is, the, is the director of it now. But it never lists us all the one thing, you know, that's when you're getting into nitty gritties of the thing. The stadium was owned by the association and it's now regarded as one of the best stadiums in the world. It's definitely, I think, the best stadium in Europe. And visiting the Stadium during the soccer and rugby internationals, and people from all over the world were coming there and they wondered at the magnificence of the stadium and wondered why anything so big and so magnificent, you know, and so complete could be uh, have been built in Ireland for an amateur game, you know, but that's the way it is. I think everybody associated with the association are proud of, of, uh, of Croke Park. It's, it's a magnificent, uh, it's one of the wonders of Ireland, I suppose. It's one, of the, it's one of the most magnificent stadiums, you know, anywhere. And it has, uh, has been filled umpteen times since it was built. Is he 2,300? Is the overall capacity for it? Is it is, is, is the capacity of 2,300? And has been filled many, many times. And even then, uh, there was uh, people seeking tickets who couldn't get them. You know, you would, you, you, you would go up to 100,000, I suppose, uh, if we had built it that big. But there was really no need for it. I think that the 82,200 capacity is sufficient, and the association are happy that it's sufficient. The decision to develop Croke Park it was a huge vote of confidence in the future of the GAA. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, like, that does... Uh, it guarantees the future of the association in many ways. You know, it, it's, it's the ambition of every single player to play in Croke Park. And I suppose it's the ambition of every supporter to get a seat in Croke Park when there's a big game on. But uh, it's now used by ladies football and camogie, you know, and it's also used by, by uh, in a corporate way by businesses to use it as a centre for examinations and in many, many ways at all. It's a fine building. It's not just a playing field. There's the other side of the the building. There are huge rooms and you know centres for uh, meetings and exhibitions and uh, colleges use it and everything else. You know there is a, there is a regular income from that sector as well as well as from games. They don't get all the money to, to use Crow Park. Uh, you know. Uh, from games. During the, the development of Croke Park and the plans to develop it, um, can you tell me a little bit about the relationship with the local residents of the area and their feelings on it and how how you, you yeah your really what your relationship was like? There was there was a problem the the there were problems with the residents uh, around Croke Park or they saw it as a, as, as a situation in which they were going to be disturbed by, you know, bigger crowds than ever coming there. And uh, they, they looked for compensation, and they did get compensation by way of there was 
they were compensated generously in many ways. Now I'm not going to go into nitty gritties of the how they were compensated, but they were compensated. There was community. There was a community hall built for them, and they were they were given uh, tickets for matches, and they were, they were compensated in, in quite a number of ways. You know because. They also complained about concerts being held in Croke Park. You two and some of the big, huge bands of the world have played there, you know, and uh, where the World Championship boxing match played there. You know, Cassius Clay played there, Muhammad Ali, or he fought there, and you had big events like that. And that was, I suppose, a, a source of disturbance of, for the local residents, you know, and they were demanding. Uh, you know, that they'd be compensated in some way, and they were compensated, and I would think they were compensated generously. You know, the, the, uh, I, I think they were happy about the way they were compensated. But you're almost have a situation where nobody is happy, you can't get everybody to be happy about uh, some programme of, of compensation. You know, I think they did all right now. In your 31 years on, on Central Council, um, yeah. You were on Central Council for 31 years. Yeah. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit about the changes in the organisation of, of the GA as an organisation and maybe the how, how business matters were dealt with and that sort of thing? There were... Well, there, there were uh, one, of the, one of the things that changed out, that there was... Uh, as well as Rule 27, which was the ban on foreign games, there was also a rule which members of the RUC, that's the Royal Officers Constabulary, and the British soldiers and the British Army personnel could not be members of the association. There was a motion to uh, remove that rule, and that caused an awful lot of business and an enormous amount of controversy uh, in the association. And that was in, uh, I think it was about 12 years ago. And I'll tell you how it all happened. Uh, so during the time of the peace process in the North, when the Irish government and, and the people in the North were negotiating, and uh, Joe McDonough, who was the president of the association at the time, he called the Central Council together one day during the annual Congress. And he he, uh, he suspended Congress for 20 minutes or something like that. He said he wanted to discuss the matter with uh, members of the Central Council. And he called Central Council. We went into a room uh, in, in the building. And uh, he said that, oh, this is what he said now, on, late on Thursday, Holy Thursday night last this is about four minutes before this. Later on Holy Thursday night, when I arrived home, he says, from New York, a visit to New York. And they woke up in the morning on, on Good Friday and heard the news that they had reached agreement and there, would, there was going to be peace in the North. You know, he felt that as a gesture uh, to show our solidarity, our solidarity with the peacemakers that we might remove this rule and allow uh, the members of the RUC, etc., to... Uh, general association. So this was he, he he like put this very suddenly to the members of the Central Council who were kind of taken a bit of back by it, and particularly by the northern counties. You know that this nine Ulster counties, the six Ulster counties, the six counties put in particular, and there. Anyway, to make a long story short, we decided that we wouldn't take a decision on it at all. He wanted to go back out to Central Council and tell them that. You know, that in the extraordinary circumstances, we might uh, pass a, a motion today to remove that rule. And the uh, Central Council wouldn't agree anyway. They said they would require, they wouldn't be satisfied unless there was a special Congress held to take that decision. So Joe McDonough accepted that anyway, and he announced afterwards that he would hold a special Congress to debate the thing. And the special congress was organised, which was held in City West, and all, every county debated the proposal before taking the decision 
I remember our county held two or three meetings before we took our decision. And we decided that we would wait until we see what the northern counties were doing. They were the ones affected. Like they wouldn't be joining counties or clubs down here. The RUC, members of the RUC. And uh, we decided we'd wait. And a lot of other counties did the same thing. Anyway, the Congress was held, the special Congress was held in the city west. And uh, the... the uh, John McDonald, the president, he moved up to the rostrum. Uh, there, was no, there was no other motion on the agenda, just one motion, just this motion. And he proposed that uh, this thing, he said again that he, when he arrived home on, late on Friday Thursday night and he found on the following day, uh, Good Friday, that this peace agreement had been reached. And he was overcome with emotion and he, was, he thought that in solidarity with the peacemakers that we should show this gesture and we should remove this rule and that sort of thing. And we should debate it and debate and debate it. And there was an overwhelming rejection of the proposal. An overwhelming rejection of the, of, of the proposal. All the northern counties and the other the six counties in the north and the three other Ulster counties, as well as counties from all over the country, county boards from all over the country, were vehemently against it. And they were against it because the Northern delegates, they had, uh, they delivered not what should be described as, as uh, I suppose, scripted uh, uh, orations. S scripted orations delivered with pride and passion about what they were suffering from the Northern people and from the RUC and how wrong it would be, you know, to uh, allow them to join. And they told the Congress, like, how they had suffered. They were having the matches and their cars were stopped and the police taken out of the boats and thrown over the ditch into the next speed and that sort of thing, and Jersey thrown, thrown on the road. And there was that sort of suffering by the RUC, and there were a lot of other uh, reasons why they felt that the thing shouldn't be uh, passed. And uh, the meeting starts at 2.30, and at... 6.30, shortly after 6.30, after four hours discussion, uh, the people at the top table proposed that the Congress would adjourn for 10 or 12 minutes in order that uh, 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 a motion, uh, let's see what the name of the motion, the, the motion now, uh, A motion would be drafted, you know, to uh, resolve the thing because they knew it was going to be hammered. That's uh, an amendment. An amendment would be would be, would, be, would be drafted. But anyway, they came back in about twelve minutes and the amendment was drafted, and the, road, the, the motion was defeated, very, very, very heavily defeated, without a vote being taken. And the reason was the reason that a vote wasn't taken was because. Uh, the number of speakers against it clearly and clearly outnumbered the very few people who were in favour of it. And it was quite obvious, like, you know, that's, uh, that the motion to remove the rule would be hammered. And uh, it was, uh, that was the end of that time, it was defeated. And there was a lot of bitterness about it at the beginning, before the thing was was uh, moved. But on the morning after that, mo this meeting was held on a Saturday, and on the following morning, I was going out to Mass, and I got a phone call from a, one of the people in the north, thanking Waterford for their support. And uh, he spoke to me at length about it, you know. And he says, in the end, he said, you know, we felt here in the north, and I was speaking for other counties as well, he says, in the north. We felt very, very pleased with the whole thing. He said we were bitter about it at the beginning. But it was an event, he said, it was in, in eventually, he said, it was a blessing in the skies. In that it showed the northern counties that the southern counties were solidly behind them. And we never had an opportunity before to find that out, he said. But the way that, that, that the southern counties supported us uh, yesterday and last night, he said, we were absolutely thrilled. 
And that was the good side of the whole thing. But anyway, it was agreed that subsequently the 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 uh, PSNI, that's the Northern Ireland Police Service, replaced the the uh, what do you call it the the RUC, the RUC, the RUC, and Catholics were brought into the. Uh, equation then, and they were allowed to join the PSNI, which is Northern Ireland Police Service, and that now it's all the one. So the, the, the rule was removed then, and everybody was happy about it. But that was a very, very con uh, controversial uh, period in the association also. During my time, you're talking about what happened in my time. Another controversial thing, very, very controversial, was the establishment of the uh, Players Association, the GPA, Gaelic Players Association. And it was started by a small group and then it, it grew in strength and strength. And uh, Desi Farrell was the, he, he was the chief uh, uh, mover in, in having this thing, a Gaelic Players Association. And we felt, I certainly felt anyway, as a member of the Central Council, this was something of a rival association, or in other words, I thought it was kind of a players' trade union, where they were demanding better rights for players and uh, better uh, conditions for players. And uh, I, I felt personally, this is my personal feeling, that eventually it would lead to play for pay, and uh, that meant professionalism. And I thought that would be the beginning of the end for the whole association. That was my feeling about it. And that feeling was shared by an awful lot of other people who felt that the Early Players Association was in effect a sort of a trade union that was emerging and uh, that there would be demands would increase, in the, uh, et cetera, et cetera, if they did get recognition. So uh, there was a lot of business about that. So lots of players in Ireland joined it and lots of players wouldn't join it. And then when the Cork uh, strike came on, uh, players went on strike about the the the, uh, the manager. They didn't like the manager. They wanted to change the man. This sort of thing. I thought it was another exhibition of showing strength, player strength, and uh, or player power, which was a dangerous thing. And the the, the movement, the GPA movement, seemed to grow strength and, from strength to strength. Until it reached a point that uh, their demands were increasing. But the GA still wouldn't recognise them. They still would not recognise them. And eventually the negotiations took place. And uh, it was agreed that they would come in under the GA umbrella. And that they would be subject to the rules and regulations of the GA. And that the GA would, uh, in all cases, have uh, overpowering... Uh, rights in making decisions and all that sort of thing. And the GAA, GAA in turn uh, gave them uh, revenue to uh, help players who might need assistance, you know, and in any way whatsoever. Uh, I think to the million euros, a million euros a year or something like that, that would get to uh, improve the lot of players and all that sort of thing. So there was a very, very satisfactory ending to it, eventually. And that only came this year, Congress this year. So it had a kind of a, a happy ending. It was a problem that had a happy ending. And uh, that's, uh, I think, this next month is about the fact that the whole thing will, will be uh, officially uh, launched, that the, the GPA... Now, it's an arm of the GEA, you know, it's a player's uh, body who will be totally and absolutely subject to, to the GEA. So that's, that's ended, that's uh, controversy. And do your concerns about the GPA remain? Not now. No, that, there was assurances given uh, through Central Council and eventually given to Congress in Newcastle and County Down this year. And... Uh, that there will be no question of strike or no question of uh, doing anything that's in controversy, uh, that's in conflict with association policy 
and with the rules of the association. And once that, is, that assurance was given, like we're happy that the, you know, the thing will work out all right. And I think it will, I'm certain that it will work out all right. You mentioned that, uh, you mentioned sponsorship early, earlier on. Yeah. That was another thing too. There was a lot of thinking done before sponsorship would be accepted. And I think that the, 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 the Wexford County Board, as far as I recall, it was the Wexford County Board <coughs> who submitted a motion proposing that that would be accepted. And that was about uh, nearly 20 years ago. And eventually it was carried. And then we eventually got large sponsorship from the big, big films, the multinational films like Arthur Guinness and, uh, and uh, the Bank of Ireland and the AIB and from Carol's all stuff, Carol's uh, Tobacco and all that sort, those big companies came in and gave massive sponsorship. And from that then, counties were allowed to accept sponsorship and clubs were allowed to accept sponsorship. And the amount of sponsorship now uh, being given is like you know, thousands, um, sorry, hundreds of millions every year. You know, all over, taking all over the country. Like the Guinness sponsorship now, the holding and the Bank of Ireland sponsorship for football and the AIB sponsorship for the other grades <clears throat> and all the bodies that gave uh, sponsorship, you know, uh, gave it generously. And the, the amount of publicity that the GA is, is uh, generating and, and, and uh, helping those films, if, if sponsorship does help, you know, they're doing everything they can to help. We got sponsorship from the uh, RTE as well, and from many, many other films, there's many, many other films, but it was a very controversial thing at the end, and there some years ago there was very uh, strong opposition to giving Guinness uh, sponsorship because of the drink situation, and I don't believe that, I don't believe there's... Uh, this, the sponsorship by Guinness means that people are going to drink any more than they drank before, but I don't think that's affecting. They, they, there are a lot of anti-drink people in the GEA and very, very good people. And they have very, very uh, genuine reasons for, you know, being anti-drink maybe. But a lot of these people were anti, uh, anti they were opposed to accepting uh, sponsorship from the drink companies, you know. When, when sponsorship came in overall, um, can you tell me about some of the discussions that were had that were pro and against uh, corporate sponsorship in the GAA? Well, there was a feeling generally that you know, like sponsors, particularly strong sponsors, would have an exercise... Would exercise a certain amount of control, you know, which was understandable that uh, a sponsor uh, paying a lot of money, uh, you know, to, to an association for a particular uh, aspect of their activities would exercise some control. You know, sponsors giving millions of pounds a year would, would uh, they were, I suppose, there was a feeling that they would exercise control. And it was something new too, like it's something, anything new that's proposed, it, it does, uh, you know, naturally meet with opposition uh, in some respects. And I suppose just because it's something new and something unexpected, it was uh, those people opposing it anyway. But uh, it wasn't really, it wasn't as a major event now as the other matters that I've, I've mentioned, like, you know, like like they wrote the rugby and soccer and the ban and the other things and the RUC and matters and that, but it was nevertheless a, a big matter, you know. But another matter that was a very uh, very controversial from the start, and that was the backdoor system. That all games in Ireland in, in, in the, under the GA control were played on a knockout basis. And this backdoor system would give promises the right to allow counties to come back into the championship if they were beaten in the first round, you know, in holding on football. And uh, it, it uh, 
there was tremendous opposition to that when the start was pushed and it was defeated on a number of occasions, but gradually it was accepted uh, that uh, a county beaten and holding out, for instance, in holding out football uh, in, in the opening rounds uh, would come back in, in a kind of a loser's group situation and get another chance at remaining in, in contention for the All Ireland. And that eventually was extended to the situation that's there now, where a county uh, like, uh, for instance, Kelly last year, they were beaten in the Muslim Championship and they won the All Ireland. You know, they were allowed to proceed in the, in the All Ireland series, even though they were beaten in one game in, in the uh, province and one game outside. So uh, it was, uh, uh, I, was, uh, I was in favour of it from the start. And uh, there's nothing against it, but <coughs> it's, uh, I don't know, will we'll, 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 we'll find a situation where everybody was satisfied because uh, it's tough now to win a monster final. It's very difficult to win a monster final. And then to be beaten eventually by a team that you beat in the monster championship. And they go on to the All Ireland, and you go out. You know that that will. Uh, I don't know if they will ever get uh, total agreement on the, uh, you know, on the value of that sort of a system. But it does give more matches, <clears throat> and uh, it is all part of the. Uh, it's all part of, of the difficulties that are rising, you know, because of, uh, uh, of, of too much inter-county activity. And the more inter-county activity we have, the less time there is for club activity. And club activity is absolutely vital. It's more important, much, much more important than inter-county activity. And there is a feeling, it's not a feeling at all, it is a fact there's so much inter-county activity now that club activity has been affected. And that's all tied in with this business of managers. Managers of county teams now are kind of, uh, they seem to be overpowering and they try to control the activities of county board. And players on a county panel, there's 30 players, maybe a lot more sometimes, it's limited to 30, it's now limited to 26, but managers are playing more, are, are uh, having more than that on, on the panels. And uh, those players then, managers are, are, are preventing them from training with their clubs at certain times. And clubs are, clubs and managers are kind of sixes and sevens and they're arguing with each other, <coughs> that sort of thing. The whole idea of managers all over the country, in all the counties, as far as I know, you know, they're exercising more control now in the county board. And there is a kind of an anti-manager, uh, I won't say a campaign, but there is an anti-manager feeling growing throughout the whole association. And I think myself it's time that they were controlled. And uh, I don't know where that's from from now that we, mm -hmm. we said that. We were talking about the, the back door system. We were oh, talking the back about door system, yes. having yeah. having just retired from from Central Council and looking at your career in GAA administration. What are your views on how the GAA is run today? Well, I'm kind of glad you asked me that question, because <coughs> no, because I, I definitely views on it. Like you know, the GAA is an amateur association, and it's run by volunteers. And gradually, it's becoming more like a civil service, run in a civil service style, in Cork Park, for instance. Now, I think that the, the, the uh, Cork Park uh, it has grown in in, uh, in a management system that's uh, too big for itself. I think there are too many uh, committees in Cork Park. And the number of people employed to run those committees like is increasing. And when that happens, you're going to have clubs 
and county boards, clubs in particular, uh, burdened with additional work because people in Croke Park were organised and paid to uh, operate a certain section of the whole thing. They're going to create work for themselves and they're going to create burdens and work for the people down below at club level and county level, mostly at club level, like who are volunteers again and who are, or, you know, who are running an amateur organisation and striving to do this and that sort of thing. The work on those, on clubs all the country has been increased all the time. And that's not a good thing for the association. And I wonder, like, where it's all going to end and when there's going to be a break there, you know, that clubs would call a horn to this thing and say that secretary of clubs particularly and treasurers and chairmen who have been overworked, or the sports secretary in particular, you know, uh, they're going to say, I'm not going to stick this much longer. And you have, undoubtedly now, it is a civil service style organisation. And it's a civil service style operation in Cork Park. And I'm really worried about it. And I think a lot of people are worried about it. You know, that's one of my worries. And another worry I have about the association is that I think, and I said this uh, to a group of uh, people in, in uh, Central Council with whom I was having a drink one night about three years ago, we were, talking about, we were speculating about the election for the president and uh, I said, I wonder who will be president of, president of the association when pay for play comes in, when pay for play comes in. And they kind of laughed and said to me, but one of them said to me since, he said, I've been thinking about what you said, he says, and you know, you mightn't be far out. I think that pay for play will come in. I think we're heading that way. And one of the reasons we're heading that way is the demands on players, you know, it's becoming, uh, uh, it's enormous as it is, and it's becoming worse and worse and worse. And it's all together because of the way that, that managers are striving to uh, get teams to win and to prepare them in such a way that they'll, they'll be, you know, better uh, equipped to meet uh, the challenges that they have to meet at, at inter-county level. Players are now training three and four nights a week. Three and four nights a week. They're almost expected to train with their clubs. Then they're away every so they're playing challenge matches or championships. And you, you have under 21 people now in that grade, under 21. They're playing under 21 hurling and football with their counties. They must also be playing senior hurling and senior football with their counties. And they're also playing in the same grades with their clubs. Now that's going to become impossible and that they are definitely, definitely being overworked. And uh, I think that, that, that the, uh, the bubble is going to burst if that thing, unless it's controlled. I know that, that uh, Polly Duff, you know, is talking about, he's, he's the president of the association, he, and he's the old steward of all. And Christy Cooney, I think, too, is in favour of it. That this thing has to be looked at. And that they... they Managers like who are going outside the rules and they're doing whatever they like. They're, they're playing with bigger panels than they're, than, than they're allowed by rule. They're playing, uh, they're having more training sessions than they're supposed to have by rule. And they're training before the year ends for the following year. And if something isn't done to arrest all that, I think we're going to be in very, very serious trouble. And, and, and within a short time, I'd say within a few years. And on that basis, players will feel that they're entitled to some of the cake, some of the money generated, you know, uh, by the, the uh, attendances uh, at uh, the bigger games and that sort of thing. And that would be a very, very bad development. And so something that will, I think will be the... I wouldn't say to ruin the association, but it could damage them beyond repair. It's something I'm really worried about. How important, in your opinion, then, is amateurism and volunteerism within the GAA? Huh? How, how important is amateurism and volunteerism, in your mind, in the GAA? More important are they? Yeah. They're absolutely vital. The, the, lifeblood, the, the, the lifeblood of the association are the people that own the voluntary work. That have always been done it. There's people working for, for, for clubs 
night and day for six and seven days of the week, you know, and they're leaving their families, uh, uh, you know, they're not uh, maybe giving the attention to their families that they should be given, you know, and uh, the families then would be kind of, you know, maybe annoyed to the extent that there could be a, a serious rift between a, a man and his family because he's away so often from home and that sort of thing. And that is happening. That people down at the lower end of the association, at club level, you know, people mind the jerseys, people cutting the grass and people doing all the things that are necessary to prepare a, a ground and to prepare a team and all that sort of thing. They're doing enormous work in a voluntary capacity. And it's extraordinary that it is, it is continuing at the rate it is, which it is continuing. It's, it's a tribute to the people. It's a tribute to the to the those people who are doing that work, you know. And and there's wonderful, 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 wonderful people in the association doing wonderful voluntary work. And uh, I, I, as an admirer of that type of people, like I'm worried that they they it might not continue. You know, if if the amount of work they're required to do uh, continues. Because at this day and age, the voluntary element of everything is, is reducing. Like, very few people are doing anything for nothing now. Except in the GA, as I have said. You know, the day of, of uh, voluntary contributions, they're, 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 they're becoming less and less and less. Uh, the, the, you know, they're, they're, they're on the downward trend, I think. And... Uh, that, that's, that's something that would worry me now at last Virginia, you know. You mentioned um, that trying to strike a balance between, you know, working with the GAA and and family life. Yeah. How, how did you manage your that balance in your life between your involvement in the GAA and your family life? Well, it, it, uh, it was difficult, but I got splendid cooperation from my family. Splendid cooperation from my son. But you must remember, Regina, that was 40, 50 years ago, you know, and things were much different then. Life is more demanding now, you know, family life and is more demanding now than it was at that time. You know, uh, there's that, that, that a huge difference in, in lifestyles and everything else now, like, you know, and... and uh, uh, people have different views in it. Uh, there's a, the generation of people 40 and 50 years ago were a different, or people with a different outlook altogether, you know. And the, the voluntary effort was something that was praised and encouraged and promoted. But not so much now. There's very, very little uh, uh, support now for voluntary, for the voluntary element in anything. That's my, my, that's my opinion. You know, another thing I would like to tell you just in this is that the styles of holding and the styles of football have changed enormously since the days when I was uh, active as a club secretary and as a divisional board secretary. In, in, the, in the 50s and 60s, particularly the 60s and 70s, and maybe for a while in the 80s, for, maybe for a long time in the 80s, uh, the style of holding was much, much more attractive and much more, diff much more uh, uh, appealing to to uh, supporters, and in that uh, the skills were more uh, the skills of holding and football were, were, were totally and absolutely different. Like today, now in football, for instance, you have the, it's only a form of handball. It's, it's the ball is handled probably more time than is kicked during a match. And there is this uh, policy of crowding a player when he gets a ball. And you take the all in the semi-final last Sunday now, which was a splendid game, as was the one on the previous week, when Cork uh, just uh, defeated uh, Dublin last Sunday now. Uh, I, I don't know, I'm right wrong, but that's now last Sunday, 
Yes, that's when the court defeated Down uh, in the controversial finish. And on the previous one, the... Uh, I'm, sorry, I'm wrong about that now. Yeah, no, I think... No, was... Down defeated Kildare Dare, in yeah. controversial circumstances. And on the previous one, the Cork beat Dublin. Yeah, they were both decided by a point or two. Uh, there was an awful lot of fouling, uh, and an awful lot of uh, crowding. When the player got the ball, he was crowded around and he was pushed out of it, and that sort of thing. And there was no catch and kick, and the catch and kick element, which was the thing that was most admired in football, has gone completely. And in holding, it's the same thing. Uh, the like brute force now is, is very, very important in both the games. Like in holding, you have no uh, duels between players anymore. It's uh, when the player gets a ball now, they're hunting packs, you know, and uh, there's not a lot of crowding, and players don't have the opportunity to strike the ball, and the, the, the exercise of skills is diminishing rapidly. And people will tell you, if you look on television or on films of games that were played long ago and games that played now, there's an enormous difference. The only exhibition of falling that we saw this year was the game between Tipperary and Galway in, in, the, in the qualifier. And uh, that was a lovely game where player match player. And there was no very, very little crowding and that sort of thing. The style of the game, I think, is, is suffering as a result. But that's the way it is going to be because the the uh, the will to win and the desire to win and the uh, attitude of managers and the people managing the teams is a win at all costs, you know. And uh, I think the styles have faded badly, and uh, as a result, the games have lost the quality that they had at one time. I remember in the fifty years. 59 and 56 and, uh, and, and 60 and 61 seems to the holding was absolutely magnificent. I thought the games that were in Kenny and Warford and Kilkenny and Tipperary and Kilkenny and Cork and Dawson at that time was absolutely, and Wexford now at the time of the the, the uh, records and all those uh, players, you know, there was a different type, a different style of game altogether. And to me, maybe because I'm growing older, that I don't. Uh, I, I think that, but I don't know. I think a lot of people, all the people, most of the people to whom I speak now, agree with me that the style of holding and the style of football has changed for the worse. You'd also have been looking at the the matches from a journalistic point of view. You've been the GAA correspondent for the Dungarvan Leader. Is that right? For yes, I have been that for fifty. Three years. I, I became the correspondent of the Dungarvan Leader in 1957. And uh, I, I never missed a week. I think only once or twice during that length of time I only missed out on making my weekly contribution. I, 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 uh, I write under, under the pen name Commentator. And I've covered games in all club games and divisional board games, county board games, county finals, and all grades, seniors down to under 16 and uh, inter-county games as well. I've covered games everywhere and uh, that, that's, that's a long, long time to be uh, uh, reporting on games. Of all of your involvement in the GAA, what has been the most satisfying? What role or what time has been the most satisfying for you? That's something now, Eugene, I have to ponder on, you know. I was, all, I was always delighted to be involved, always delighted and always happy and always honoured to be involved. And uh, I, I, uh, I'm delighted, that, delighted to have, have met so many wonderful people. Uh, and uh, there was 19 presidents uh, in my lifetime in the GS, since 1953, there were 19 presidents. And I think I met every one of them. And I met, I, I met uh, Patrick O'Keefe, who was uh, the Director General uh, for a long time, until 19... Uh, I don't know what year he left, but uh, Sean O'Shea uh, 
took over then and then uh, Lee Muller took over and then Paul Dick Duffy took over like and as well as meeting them and, and there was wonderful, wonderful, wonderful people that I met. I, I wouldn't name any of them because I would want to be invidious and just select certain people but some of them were great, great friends with me and uh, I, I was during my time in management I was in Australia with uh, other members of the management committee, three other members of the management committee and uh, I met them and I, I, I became great, great friends with them and great, great friends with people in office that I was dealing with, you know, and people uh, that were in opposition to me as well, you know. And uh, I, I, I find it difficult now to, to put my finger on the uh, one thing that made me very, very happy. I'm very, very happy to see Wolf win the Orland in 19... The last Orland in 1959 uh, against Kilkenny. And the awful thing about that is that that's the last time we won an Orland in the Orland in the and Kilkenny have won 19 holding finals since then. You know, and uh, you'd wonder why we didn't uh, succeed. Uh, maybe not as well as Kilkenny, of course, but we didn't uh, at least achieve uh, a few all islands. Th th those are disappointing uh, disappointments that I, I suffered. You have lots of... Lots of uh, uh, Happiness, lots of happy uh, events and lots of sad events. Being beaten, county teams being beaten would always put you, you know, in a bad mood for a while. And county victories uh, would also uh, elate you and make you very, very happy and proud and, you know, privileged to be involved in that sort of thing. It's a kind of a mixture of uh, sadness and satisfaction and all these things, you know. And you find it impossible to leave it. I I, I, uh, I probably, maybe I shouldn't have stayed on as long as I did until I was 1989, but uh, I, I was, uh, I wanted to stay on and I was being pressed to stay on also. And uh, at this year, the five-year rule is now uh, in vogue and uh, lots of people, 17 other members of Central Council also retired this year at the uh, Congress in Newcastle in County Down and because of the limitation of service. Now whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know. There are some great people that have to leave office, you know, because of the rule, and uh, it's a pity to lose them. And there's another aspect of it too, that there might be people in office in some uh, grade or another, uh, or in some section or another, who mightn't be that good, and it's a good thing maybe that they have to leave office. But I think myself it would be better in the long run if the decision to hold on to an officer or get rid of him should be left to the committee of whatever uh, section of the GA he's involved in, you know. Uh, I don't know will the rule ever change. I don't think it is a, I don't think it's a good rule in the end, you know. What what would you have done if you weren't involved in the GAA? What would you have done with your time, do you think? That's a very good question, Jane, and I, and I wonder myself what I would have done with it, you know. Uh, I was often thinking about writing a book, and uh, I would probably have done that, you know. Being a correspondent of the of the Dungarvan leader, uh, I was very involved in, 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 in GA uh, affairs, and very uh, interested in promoting... Uh, the association in many ways. That's why I, I was involved in writing books and that sort of thing. And I would probably have written a book, you know, a real history of the GA in, in Warford. Maybe if I wasn't involved in the, uh, as I had been involved, you know, in the different uh, sections of the thing, like a divisional board secretary, club secretary, or central council or management and that, you know. And uh, anyway, I, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't regret one moment of my time in, in the association, whatever role I played. And uh, I'd do it all over again if I had the time. Tell me, Seamus, is there anything I haven't asked you that you'd like to talk about? Happened last year. 
anything that that uh, anything at all that that I haven't asked you about that you'd like to to talk about or tell me about. No, I don't think there is. Like you know, there is. There was so much happened that it's difficult to uh, be selective in talking about different uh, events and different phases. But uh, I don't know. Uh, if there is anything that I, I, I would, uh, I, I, I'm leaving out. Uh, are you are you optimistic about the future of the GAA, Seamus? I am. I'm a bit worried about it, but uh, I, 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 I'm. Uh, I think to be an awful thing if if uh, if something were to happen to do very very serious damage to the association, and. Uh, the only thing I would see as, as doing very dangerous is pay, if pay for play in any form at all is introduced I think it will do irreparable damage to the association because it will uh, completely damage the voluntary aspect of the whole thing and uh, if you're amateur versus professional the mix is not going to work if you're amateur versus uh, professional in any aspect of life it won't work they won't work together voluntary and and uh, and professional you know won't work because a player that's uh, raising money for club uh, club survival uh, you know uh, he's not going to work as hard as the fellow that's playing that he's doing it for is getting paid you see <laughs> And like the number of people all over the country, like when, when the GS started in, in, in November the 1st, uh, 1884, no club on the field, no, every club, there's about roughly 2,000 clubs in the country, they all have fields, they all have dressing rooms, they all have pavilions, they all have all weather pitches, they all have all weather pitches, a number of them, a big number of them, a growing number have all weather pitches, they are floodlighting. You know, and they have other facilities as well. They have gyms, a lot of them have bars and social clubs and that sort of thing. And it's all run by, by volunteers. And like, you couldn't expect more than that in any organisation or in any country in the world. And I don't think in any country in the world you have that situation. You know, and I, I, I'd be terrified that anything might happen to damage that. You know, and I think if the voluntary effort goes out, you know, it's been serious, very, very serious trouble for, for, for the whole three year. Seamus, thanks so much for your time. You're all welcome. Thank you and very I, much. I'm sorry I had more to say, but I suppose we had too much to say in the end. Not at all. No, that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you.